evening portion of today's session. Uh, Tony, could you please call roll? Jimenez. Corrales. Here. Cohen. Carrasco. Here. Davis. Here. Esparza. Arenas. Here. Foley. Here. Mahan. Here. Jones. Present. Licardo. Present. You have a quorum. All right, thank you. Um, so we have item 3.6, which is the Community Economic Recovery Strategy and Approach Study Session. Um, that's scheduled next, and then we have one final item after that, which is the Kelsey Air Station Apartments. Um, given the fact that this was specially set, um, this study session for six o'clock, I, I think we should probably proceed with that, given that I think that will be on the top of mind for the public. So why don't we proceed with item 3.6? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, Kip, we're going to show a couple of videos first. Yep. Yeah, yes, I'm going to show some videos for the interpretation services, and then Dave will kick us off. Uh, it'll take me just a second to do the screen share, hopefully correctly. So just one second here. Hola y bienvenidos a esta reunión. Para acceder a la función de interpretación, haga clic en el icono de globo en la parte inferior de la ventana de Zoom y selecciona el idioma que desea. Para escuchar claramente el audio de interpretación, le recomendamos que también seleccione la opción para silenciar el audio original, que es la opción más baja en el menú después de hacer clic en el icono del globo. Xin chào và cảm ơn quý vị đã tham dự buổi họp ngày hôm nay. Để truy cập vào phần thông dịch của ứng dụng Zoom, xin nhấn vào biểu tượng hình quả địa cầu ở phía dưới của màn hình và chọn ngôn ngữ theo ý muốn của quý vị. Để nghe rõ lời phiên dịch, chúng tôi khuyến khích quý vị chọn chức năng tắt âm thanh góc nằm ở phía cuối trong phần tùy chọn của biểu tượng quả địa cầu. Ok, Dave, it's all you. Yeah, good. Thank you. And th thank you to the mayor and the council for this opportunity for us, for this dedicated time to really talk through um, how we're going to transition uh, into recovery here. And there's a lot of thought that's been put into this, but a lot of work to do. Um, you're, you're going to see our, our roadmap for recovery, um, which is a specific roadmap to the, to the work that we anticipate doing here. Um, and in our goal here to, to, to build back better. Um, so what's also a little bit new is, is Rosalind and, and um, Kip have been co-leading this effort. Um, you're, gonna, you're gonna hear about how we're going to approach this work. You're gonna hear about how we've made some changes to the uh, city enterprise priorities to really emphasize uh, the work here in recovery. Um, and you're also going to hear from many of our, our leaders in the organization that are working in various uh, segments of this recovery work. Um, and as um, I think it was uh, Lee earlier mentioned, um, we will actually have a dedicated budget study session on May 17th around how we put the recovery dollars, put those dollars into uh, this recovery work and match those things up. So. With that, I'm going to pass it off to uh, Kip and Rosalind. Great. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Mayor and City Council and members of the public, uh, Rosalind Huey, Deputy City Manager. And first, I'd like to review what we will cover with you in this evening's study session. So first, we'll discuss our transition from Emergency Operations Center to Community and Economic Recovery. Next, we'll review the city roadmap for recovery. We'll share, we will share our approach and how we will be organized to undertake our work. You will hear from various city departments. Staff will share their key initiatives underway now, what we will start next year and in future years. 
And then we will want to hear the council's ideas on the COVID-19 task force and the Build Back Better initiative that were added to the city roadmap in March. And of course, we will want to hear from members of our community and we will have that opportunity through public comment. And then we will conclude with next steps. Next slide. So at the end of our dialogue this evening, we want to accomplish three key things. First, a common understanding of the transition from emergency operations center to recovery. Second, we will have a sense of what is likely to happen now, next year, and in future years as it relates to our recovery initiatives that are outlined in the city roadmap. And then lastly, staff will want to get clarity from the council on what should be achieved with the new COVID-19 task force and build back better initiative. Next slide. So this slide shows the city roadmap that city council approved back in March. It includes 41 high priority change initiatives to focus and align the city's efforts and resources in the next fiscal year. 18 initiatives guide our response and recovery to the pandemic. Those are outlined in pink. And then 23 initiatives shown in the light purple color are characterized by our enterprise priority. Next slide. So as Dave mentioned, the city administration is proposing to add community and economic recovery as a new enterprise priority. And on this slide, you'll see this has been outlined in the first row um, highlighted by the green dotted line. Additionally, we have combined two enterprise priorities, the future of downtown and building the San Jose of tomorrow private development services. The resulting new name is building the San Jose of tomorrow with a downtown for everyone. This reflects the importance of continued improvements and development services to move projects forward in downtown, as well as citywide, that will ultimately help us realize our vision for community and economic vitality. These priorities are already driving our work and resources and will continue to drive our transition from response to recovery. Next slide. So as we move into recovery, we think it's important that we all have a really good understanding of what this work really involves um, and, and have come up with this uh, statement. So we recognize um, the pain and trauma that so many people in our community have endured and actually continue to endure during this time. We know that our biggest challenge and our biggest opportunity is to foster an equitable recovery to a better normal. We acknowledge that our journey to healing and recovery will require unprecedented resources, effort, and creativity, and that we absolutely cannot do this work alone. It must be done with our entire community for the benefit of those most burdened by the crisis. Next slide. So from this understanding, we start with guiding principles for the entire city organization. Across city departments, we're going to approach our recovery work and ground our work by leading with people. We are focused on equity and closing the widening gap on inequities that will lead us to a sustainable future. Recovery, recovering better means improving the lives of the most vulnerable. We know that if recovery efforts do not seek to include the most marginalized, we will fail to build a better community than we had at the outset of the pandemic. By helping those most in need, we actually lift our entire community. We choose to view each other and those we serve as neighbors, and our approach must ensure the dignity of our residents and those that we are serving. We know that we must extend empathy, that is understanding a person's situation from their perspective and not our own. 
And all of this, of course, leads us to action. The changes, the tools, the resources that actually help people get back on track and poised to thrive. A path that brings st stability to our children, our families, our small business owners, our nonprofit organizations. This is what community and economic recovery is all about. Next slide. And lastly, we really do want to acknowledge that our guiding principles for recovery are embodied in existing efforts already completed or those that are underway. And so those include the equity pledge that the city council approved last June, the Silicon Valley, the Silicon Valley Recovery Roundtable Report, the Downtown Recovery Strategy, and the County's Health and Equity Task Force. I will now turn the presentation over to Zulma Maciel, who will speak more about our work in racial equity. Thank you, Rosalind. And good evening, Mayor and City Council. I'm Zulma Maciel, Director of the Office of Racial Equity. I'm grateful for the opportunity to participate in the study session with my colleagues who've been working very hard to alleviate the harm for those most burdened by this crisis. And in keeping with the equity principle, we recognize, as Rosalind said, that our biggest challenge and our biggest opportunity is to foster an equitable recovery. So it's important to understand that advancing racial equity is both a process that we're going through and ultimately an outcome. So I wanted to make sure that we centered in a couple of things and um, just to ground us in, in the terminology of, the, terminology of what is racial equity and why is it important? And racial equity is when race no longer predicts life outcomes, when everyone has what they need to thrive no matter where they live. And we recognize that intersectionality is key. And so just because we lead with race does not mean that we don't care about or there isn't room to also consider other disadvantaged groups across other categories like people with disabilities, women, LGBTQ, non-binary, uh, poverty, et cetera. So we don't end with race, but that is where we start if we want to have the greatest impact. And so why this is important is because systems that are failing communities of color are really failing all of us. And we know that there's been some progress that's been made over the years when it comes to equity. Yet, if you look at any measure of success, like income, education, health, and criminal justice, significant differences in outcomes based on race remain deep and pervasive. And so we aim for equity. And when we aim for equity, this means that we're focusing our efforts towards the people and places who are most impacted and most in need. And we intend to do that until those people and places are on the level playing field with the rest. So this is about taking care of all parts of our community so that our community as a whole will be better off as well as the individuals in it. And so the role of the Office of Racial Equity is to create the conditions and support for the city departments to reflect deeply in their work, ask questions differently, make their own changes, and for the office to push the city's thinking on changes that will improve the outcomes for San Jose's black and brown communities, which includes, but are not limited to, indigenous, Latino, Latina, Latinx, Asian Pacific Islanders. So we are working with the city staff and all departments towards integrating racial equity principles into the work of each department, such as looking at data and disaggregating it by race, investing time and resources into truly listening to communities of color in a way that works for them, um, increasing language access and et cetera. So in summary, the job of the Office of Racial Equity is really to make sure that racial equity is everyone's job. So now that I briefly framed the approach to community and economic recovery, you will see and hear from city leadership on the specific roadmap projects that will lead towards a better normal. Thank you, Suleiman. And what you'll see here is the uh, roadmap, uh, which is also going to be our roadmap for this session. So we're going to be focusing uh, kind of a mini TED talk on each of these six areas 
uh, which is our core to the work of the community and economic recovery. And then we'll end with our questions around Build Back Better and the Alfresco Task Force. And I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager, and along with Rosalind Huey, we'll be leading the community and economic recovery effort from the City Manager's Office. So we're going to start off with housing stabilization as our first presentation. Um, and I understand that may be uh, Reagan Henniger, um, as well as Jackie presenting this time. So let me get the slides going and turn it over to Reagan and Jackie. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Reagan Henninger, Deputy Director of the Housing Department. I'm here with Rachel Vanderveen, also Deputy Director with the Housing Department, and Jackie morales Ferrand, our Director. As we look forward into recovery, we know housing stability is critical. Not only does housing stability provide safety and security for our families, a place for children to learn, but also strength strengthens the health of our residents as we continue to live through the ups and downs of this pandemic. Next slide. Actually, one more back. Sorry about that, Kip. In March 2020, the City Council took a strong step forward by passing the first eviction moratorium in the county. This ordinance in the country this ordinance has served as the strongest tool in providing protection and stability through the pandemic. As we look to the horizon, it's unclear how long the state or local eviction moratorium will be in place. It's difficult to quantify the true scope of back rent due within San Jose. A January 2021 report from PolicyLink projects that 37,300 households in Santa Clara County are at risk of eviction and they owe a combined 173 million in back rent. Of those households, 22,000 are estimated to be low income households. Additionally, it's important to remember within our community, 27% of Latinx and 28% of black households experience severe housing cost burden. This means they pay more than 50% of their income on housing costs. Next slide. We face a dual crisis of homelessness and this global pandemic. Even pre-COVID, several systemic factors are driving more and more of our neighbors into homelessness. That includes the gap between the rich and the poor that's growing. Housing that it, that's affordable to the lowest income families is not being built, creating a massive housing shortage for those most in need. And longstanding racial inequities continue to disproportionately affect who becomes homeless in our community. People of color are dramatically more likely to become homeless than their white counterparts. COVID has had a significant impact on our existing shelters. In March 2020, we immediately reduced shelter capacity system-wide by over 500 beds. We built that capacity back plus more with new temporary shelters, hotels, and our emergency interim housing. However, demo however demobilizing and transitioning these efforts and ensuring that no one returns to the streets will be a tremendous lift that takes time and resources. Next slide. Overall, Santa Clara County is generally similar to other communities across the nation with high rates of homelessness among people of color. These disparities are particularly prevalent among Black, Indigenous, and Hispanic and Latinx populations. In contrast, non-Hispanic people and those who identify as Asian, Asian American are both significantly underrepresented in the homeless population. Next slide. The housing department's recovery work falls into these four broad categories, emergency rental relief, eviction help, shelter and EIH transitions, and equitable and inclusive housing policy development. Next slide. Our response 
to housing stabilization. Uh, now we are managing the implementation of rent relief. The city and county have received a combined 57 million in the first round of emergency rental assistance and 62 million in funds at the state level. We're working with our partners to educate tenants and landlords on the current policies and programs to provide assistance to them. And we continue to provide funding for isolation and quarantine options for families and individuals exposed to COVID-19. Next, we'll open an eviction help center and expand legal services for those in need. We'll also prioritize enforcement of the tenant protection ordinance and continue to provide support for isolation and quarantine. And later, we'll maintain eviction protections and legal services and we'll continue to enforce the tenant protection ordinance. Next slide. We're planning now for shelter transitions at South Hall and preparing for home key hotel acquisition soon that can help in the next and later part of transitioning homeless individuals. Next, we plan on adding homeless housing assistance resources at South Hall, our largest shelter, to work with those individuals to find alternative housing options. And later, we'll need to change the long-term operating model of our emergency interim housing sites so they are more cost effective. Next slide. Our residential anti-displacement strategy is all about equity and stabilizing neighborhoods. We're currently implementing three anti-displacement strategies that council prioritized in September. Our tenant preference legislation, SB 649, community opportunity to purchase program and an equitable COVID response. We'll also bring forward the Deardon Affordable Housing Plan next month. And later we'll be bringing forward the assessment of fair housing and implementing our tenant preferences and Deardon plans. Next slide. Finally, we can't do this work alone. We are rooted in community partnership. And these are our key relationships, but not all of them. Our anti-displacement working group, which we just launched a couple weeks ago has over 43 organizations represented and our local emergency rental assistance program has 47 community partners. Now I'll hand it over to Nancy Klein and Jeff Rester. Thank you very, very much. Nancy Klein, Director, Office of Economic Development here with Jeff Ruster and with Chris Burton, who both will be available to answer questions. I wanna say that you're very much hearing the themes of working in partnerships and working with community. And those themes will continue across workforce development and small business. Next slide, please. Prior to the traditional, prior to COVID, the traditional statistics would tell you that our economy was indeed hot. Economic indicators showed record low employment and record median income. Next slide, please. However, the reality was certainly not true for all. When we adjust for the cost of living and also asked residents what would happen if they had one unexpected $500 expense, then approximately 40% of households replied that they would be in trouble and at risk. Of particular note, within this 40%, there was an overrepresentation of Latinos and more general immigrant households relative to the overall population as you, you saw previously in, in the housing slides. Next slide, please. When the pandemic hit, we saw local employment rates skyrocket, generally to a peak of 12.2% within a few short months. Although this uh, occurred across the board, it's important to note that the unemployment rate in the leisure and hospitality sector increased to almost 40% nation nationally 
and locally nearly 51,000 leisure and hospitality jobs were lost. Again, given the overall representation of Latinos, African Americans, and women in this sector, we saw exceedingly high rates of unemployment at 18, almost 19% for Hispanics, 14.9 or 15% for Asians, and roughly 16% for women. Next slide, please. The dynamic of this recovery is very different than the pre previous 2009 Great Recession. Job seekers are concerned about losing unemployment insurance, dealing with childcare issues, and facing anxiety about returning to the workplace and the economic picture, looking for jobs in a sea of changing industries. While there's been some improvements recently, the reality is that the mission of Work to Future is even more critical than ever. As a result of the economic downturn, many families in our community continue to face desperate financial situations. Next slide. Now, off, Office of Economic Development and Work to Future will focus on high growth, high wage occupations and career pathways, focusing on economic mobility and inclusion in industries like information technology, healthcare, advanced manufacturing, and construction trades. Next slide, please. Over the next three months, we will increase our outreach to low resource census tracts and are planning to move our one stop to the east side to be of more use and more proximate to the area. In addition, we will push forward and enhance programs adding, for example, a mentoring component to San Jose's works, which historically 90% of the participating youth are of color and 100% are placed in demand occupations. And we will also expand training partnerships like the recent one conducted between Work to Future and Facebook for digital marketing for youth and young adults and small businesses. On slide six, please, we will look forward to expand our earn and learn program where we provide both skill and related work, work experience to our clients. We will also start to focus on incumbent work and training to support low wage earners to advance on their career paths. Next slide, please. And but right before we jump into small business, we are currently also supporting the design of the proposed resiliency core. Youth employment, like other populations mentioned, has also not recovered nearly to the extent that the overall unemployment rate has. Youth employment peaked at 32% and is now hovering at 13%. In fact, unemployment rates for all affected uh, populations remain much higher than what we're seeing as unemployment for the region overall. Resiliency Core will provide long-term good paying jobs to individuals in high poverty census tracts, and they'll support small businesses as the economy continues to re reopen. We will likewise continue to expand our partnership with city departments such as the library and PRNS to increase connectivity to city services and related public sector career opportunities. We will also continue to work and engage with the Bridge to Recovery and look to connect with over 60 agencies to enhance services for people who could benefit in the most impacted areas. Yes, there is absolutely much to be done we will continue to prioritize those who are most impacted and has suffered the greatest through this pandemic. We will also seek to do more 
to forge new partnerships and bring economic mobility and inclusion to residents who are still facing the impacts of COVID. And here we are at small business. Um, workforce and small business go hand in hand. Um, we know that San Jose small businesses are the heart of our community. Owning a small business is a tremendous amount of work, but brings with it the satisfaction of creating something on your own. Small businesses create jobs for entrepreneurs and assist their families for sure. But importantly, they're also a source of support for each of the employees and their families. Prior to the pandemic, there were approximately 51,000 small businesses in San Jose, employing roughly 150,000 people. It's staggering to note that in 2020, roughly 44% of small businesses in San Jose closed their doors. It is a staggering number and we are not sure how many will reopen. Businesses hardest hit, as mentioned, include the hospitality, entertainment, general retail, and transportation industries. And it's also a staggering number to note that 75% of San Jose's sales tax lost in 2020 came from small businesses. Next slide, please. During the pandemic, once it hit, OED shifted 100% of our business development team to work on COVID-related business outreach and support. And we enlisted partners in the Emergency Operations Center to help us reach out so that a small in number could be effective through web, through digital outreach, phone, and as much individual contact as possible. We focused on outreach, which with a, uh, a, an intention of promoting federal and state and local loans and grants. As a result, over 13,000 PPP loans were received in San Jose in 2020. 70% of those went to small business and the estimate of those grants are, are approximately $1.1 billion. The office also supported and promoted six rounds of the California Business Relief Grant Program, and over 2,000 small businesses are estimated to have benefited in San Jose. We know that 22,000 commercial tenants have been protected by the rent eviction moratorium. I see the slide says 27,000. Thank you. And we also spent a focused effort in the rapid introduction of al fresco to support restaurants and outdoor dining next slide please we thought it was important to also include a discussion of the arts the small businesses and the entrepreneurs and the artists who are known and loved to us in san jose they contribute over a hundred million dollars of impact annually here Grants and technical assistance availability was provided on a regular basis to nonprofits. And in 1920, approximately 5.5 million was distributed in about 130 grants. A stark difference came to pass in 2021 and roughly $1.2 million in TOT was available. Fortunately, we had funds from the coronavirus relief fund for the art sector. 73 organizations received roughly $2.3 million. 45% of those organizations receiving grants serve predominantly people of color. For artists and cultural entrepreneurs, 94 artists and sole proprietors of arts-based organizations received roughly $210,000 over 60% of the artists receiving grants were people of color. Next slide, please. We have done much to try to expand what we've done here in San Jose over the COVID pandemic. 
We have worked more closely with businesses and, and support organizations like the Latino Business Foundation. We have definitely committed ourselves to a place-based program that really focuses locally on those who can do the most good and who know the areas in and around the, the sections of San Jose that have most affected, including East San Jose, Central San Jose, and downtown. We are striving to build capacity, to build new resources and include new resources so that we can benefit our community. An example is an inclusion of a new technical assistance provider with a very good track record called Start Small, Think Big to offer free legal and business advice citywide. We also were awarded two years of funding from the Economic Development Agency for a small business technical assistance and capacity building program again, to serve the most underserved businesses throughout the city. Next slide, please. We have continued to focus on digital outreach since January of 2021. Over 2,000 have attended small business webinars. We've ex sent out extensive information uh, via digital methods and have uh, achieved approximately a 34% open rate. And there's been access to hundred, hundreds of individual businesses through direct one-on-one -on -one conversations, also through email and phone hotline. We are laying a, a foundation also for ongoing work that will be sustained over the years, including permanent alfresco solutions, continuing support for small businesses, and we hope to promote what will come to us in new federal state loan and grant programs with zeal. Next slide, please. The, the hope and the intention is to shift our models, to think differently, to think more inclusively and make resources available to small business to cooperate and partner with work to future and find ways to keep expanding those who we know can be of assistance we aren't looking to be totally providing services on our own we know we can't do it alone next slide please what we are seeking to do is create an inclusive and equitable approach to economic development that both integrates traditional practices and in enhances our focus on communities of need. We'll ensure to work with nonprofits and those in sectors who can also from uh, other sectors who can provide needed resources. As a team, we are passionate about small businesses, the stories, the resources, the vitality they bring to San Jose. We are committed to work to facilitate small business recovery and to help small business adapt to a changing economic landscape. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. And now we're gonna go to John Cicerelli, uh, Jill Mariani and Nolan Beckel for a look at food and necessities and that transition. John, all you. Thanks, Kip. Um, so Jill's gonna, Jill's been, uh, the big news here, part of it is at least that it's coming over to PRNS in the recovery phase. Um, so Jill's gonna walk through these slides real quick and talk about how that's gonna work. Thank you, Jill. Thanks, John. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the Council and members of the public. My name is Jill Mariani, and I'm Acting Director of the Food and Necessities Branch of the Emergency Operations Center. And as you saw, I'm joined by John Cicerelli, the Director of Parks and Recreation and Neighborhood Services, as well as Dolan Beckel, um, who is the Director of Civic Innovation. Today, I'll be providing an update on the City of San Jose's effort in addressing food insecurity over the past year. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, communities across the United States had been battling against food insecurity for decades. 
As you can see on this chart, there were almost 700,000 meals a week being distributed to our most vulnerable populations pre-COVID. In March 2020, COVID-19 began circulating in our community and the level of food insecure residents doubled within five weeks. As Santa Clara County braced themselves to address the public health crisis, they reached out to the city of San Jose to lead and share responsibility on the food frontline and we answered the call to serve. Although we have been able to avoid a widespread food crisis over the past year, you can see that we are not out of the woods. Food insecurity has not recovered and has pretty much sustained the elevated levels since the beginning of the pandemic. Further, the data we have collected over the past year demonstrates that the majority of San Jose's food insecure residents are served through Second Harvest Food Bank in our school system. With their efforts combined, they make up 94% of the total food insecurity response in the city of San Jose, while focusing efforts to provide food assistance to low-income families and students. Next slide, please. Food insecurity also disproportionately impacts communities of color. According to the USDA Economic Research Service, Food insecurity impacts Latino, Latina, and African American populations at a double the rate, at double the rate compared to other populations. Given the fewer financial resources like savings or property than their white counterparts, all of these factors increase the likelihood for communities of color to experience food insecurity. In a city where 40% of our population is born outside the United States, food insecurity is always at our doorstep which is why it is on our city roadmap and one of our top five key priorities for the city. Next slide. Over the past year, the city of San Jose's response to food insecurity has averted a widespread food crisis for both the city and the county. When the county of Santa Clara asked us to take on food necessities while they focused their efforts on the COVID-19 public health response, the city of San Jose created the Food and Necessities Branch in the Emergency Operations Center. All of our work aimed to center around three core objectives, to feed our most vulnerable, to maximize our existing food network, and to scale for a widespread food crisis. In four weeks, we built a new business with our 29 food ecosystem partners. The city of San Jose went from supporting 3,000 meals a week through the Senior Nutrition Program to supporting the distribution of over 2.5 million meals at our peak. Going into the winter holidays, we significantly significantly ramped up our meal distribution capacity as a surge in coronavirus cases resulted in a statewide stay at home order, which further disproportionately impacted our most vulnerable. At that time, like several of the members of our council and staff, I personally made site visits to meal distribution sites. And although there were lot lines demonstrating the need, I can proudly say that we made sure that no one was going to spend the holiday season hungry. We made sure that our residents had options and that their needs would be met. And it couldn't have been done without our partners and volunteers. We've been extremely fortunate to have over 8,000 members of our community stand up beside us to help those that are of greatest need during this unprecedented time. Because of this combined effort, together we have been able to serve over 140 million meals throughout Santa Clara County, with over 80 million meals going directly to our residents here in San Jose. Next slide, please. Currently and through the end of the fiscal year, we continue to focus our efforts on our most vulnerable communities, the unhoused, older adults and medically at risk, infants and children, and finally the economically impacted. Each vulnerable community is linked with specific programs to support these efforts. We have listed each of the corresponding programs with the vulnerable populations that it serves. Next slide, please. And, e and each of the programs listed on the last slide are supported by one of our over 29 Food Network partners. Along with our volunteers, these are the real heroes. Some examples include First Five, who run a program that provides diapers and wipes and formula to infants and children. Another example is Bateman Trio who support the senior nutrition program for our older adults and medically at risk population. And as you can see, this effort is highly complex and involves multiple levels of coordination to ensure that we're meeting the needs of the community. Next slide, please. 
Thankfully, the federal government has recently taken several actions specific to food insecurity that will provide longer term sustainable relief to our impacted communities. A few examples include the USDA's recent expansion and extension for the school meal waiver program. The program has extended through June of 2022 and now includes funding for bulk meal orders and delivery to students' homes. SNAP CalFresh benefits have also been expanded with over a billion extra dollars coming in monthly to support families and individuals that qualify. These programs are already having impacts as we see school efforts on the ground leveling off, but our programs of last resort like Martha's Kitchen and Loaves and Fishes remain steady. Because of this commitment and backing of the federal government to begin addressing food insecurity, the Bookings Institute indicated last week that food insecurity rates are finally coming down, which is welcome news. With these additional safety nets coming online, we are feeling prepared to begin the planning and analysis work to transition our food and necessities response from emergency to recovery. Next slide, please. And to wrap up our segment here, we have adopted a now next later approach to our work as we transition to recovery that will take us through June, 2022. The key message here is that we recommend continuing to support our programs of last resort, our reimbursable programs and supporting the activities and work associated with Second Harvest Food Bank. We also recommend that we promote SNAP, CalFresh and meal programs that have long-term and sustainable commitments from USDA. We recommend focusing on communities and ge geographies in most need to be matched with the appropriate food assistance program or transition partners or participants to other programs as necessary. And finally, we recommend advocating alongside our partners for sound food policies that will provide additional avenues for long-term food and security solutions like universal school meals. To make sure these priorities aren't lost, as the Emergency Operations Center transitions to recovery, we'll be focusing on moving the oper operational governance under PRNS. And with that, I thank you for your time today. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, John. We're now going to go to digital equity with our city librarian, Jill Bourne. Jill, it's all you. Good evening. Um, I also want to introduce uh, our co-presenter, I guess I didn't make on the slide, is uh, Anne Grabowski, who is the Assistant Director of the Digital Inclusion Branch. Um, as the City Council knows, the Digital Inclusion Branch of the Emergency Operations Center was initiated in late April to respond to the urgent needs of our residents to be digitally connected during the pandemic. As these efforts transition to community recovery, the branch will transition to the digital equity team. As you can see, this team is remarkably cross-departmental with key members from the Office of Civic Innovation, Environmental Services, Information Technology, Parks Recreation Neighborhood Services, Public Works, and also leveraging many staff from the Library Department who oversee our relationships with school districts and community-based organizations, data management, public awareness and collateral, and direct service programs. This is an extremely talented and committed team and I wanna thank them for all their work. Next slide. The digital divide in San Jose had been studied and prioritized in the years just prior to the pandemic. However, the sudden shutdown of critical in-person services citywide and countywide quickly clarified that the ability to connect digitally had become an urgent essential human need necessary for almost every aspect of life from access to education, work opportunities, healthcare, housing, counseling and psychological support services, and so on. And existing inequities were exacerbated by both the pandemic and the lack of digital access, resulting in deeper impacts to communities by income and communities of color. We learned that significant real barriers to household internet access include lack of investment and infrastructure to support connectivity over time, the fact that many household plans are unaffordable or provide a low value for the cost, and a fear of what is being connected means for both adults and their children in terms of issues of privacy, being monitored, safety, and so on. To address this urgency, the City Council approved the 2020 Digital Inclusion Expenditure Plan the plan recognized the importance of leveraging both public and private infrastructure and assets for the benefit of residents. 
and a focus on extensive partnerships and community engagement throughout each effort. Next slide. From the beginning, the goal of this effort had been to achieve digital inclusion by addressing areas of inequity. This map was developed as our digital inclusion priority index, incorporating relevant data points by census tract. It included K-12 enrollment, poverty rates, household computer and internet access, and populations with limited English proficiency. It highlights priority census tracts in the downtown and east side regions, as well as pockets of need on the west side and variations in several districts. I wanna note that we are now talking with the community recovery and the race and equity teams regarding ways to improve and update this information, such as orienting it with new place-based neighborhood mapping that is being developed. Um, as we implemented the city council approved projects over the past year, we're also looking for data that demonstrates that the city's digital equity programs are reaching the areas that were identified as highest need. Next slide. For instance, this slide lists a couple of interesting data points collected from our hotspot borrowers. These figures are based on more than 1,100 respondents to our optional survey received at checkout. On the left, hotspot borrowers report using the hotspots for a range of activities which support education, professional development, access to services, and socializing opportunities leading to an improved quality of life. Financial challenges were identified as a barrier to broadband internet service subscriptions and almost two thirds of borrowers indicate needing digital skills building support. And just as a note, some of the other connectivity activities that were listed include unemployment applications, stimulus payment applications, news, research, online payments, housing searches, and entertainment. On the right, this chart represents the top 10, and there was a tie for 10th, hotspot borrower zip codes in San Jose checked out by residents through library and PRNS programs, through partner agencies and school district referrals, and through independent use in the zip codes listed here. There was at least one borrower represented in each of the city's zip codes. This data does not include the school hotspot distribution, which did have a saturation with our east side school partners. So it could be seen as filling gaps where the student household hotspots didn't reach. So regarding the student hotspots, the Santa Clara County Office of Education and local education agencies worked diligently to identify the highest need student households throughout the past year. And we're working to incorporate zip code data from school attendance areas. And I'm gonna turn it over to Anne for this slide. Thanks, Jill. As you can see, this new map view allows us to see the concentration of hotspot distribution around the city indicated in blue. This data includes both public hotspots by zip code and hotspots distributed through school attendance areas. The City Council and the Neighborhood Services and Education Committee has emphasized the importance of ensuring that we are addressing needs in areas in most impacted by COVID. And in pink, we see the incidence of COVID positive cases. We can see that areas of purple demonstrate the intersection of the two. As we look forward, we will continue to develop tools to show what the distribution of resources has been and ensure that we are addressing those areas of highest need and greatest opportunity. We will be working to share this data across other mapping efforts, specifically regarding housing, housing insecurity and homelessness, so that we may analyze at a more granular level. Next slide. Of course, these efforts could not have happened without the committed partnership of so many. This slide shows only about half of the organizations and agencies that partnered closely with us to develop and implement the hotspot distribution, community Wi-Fi projects, community engagement and awareness, and digital literacy programs. Not surprisingly, you will see many local education agencies and districts, key coordinators such as CETF and the Santa Clara County Office of Education, community-based organizations such as Siren or Billy DeFrank, industries such as AT&T and HP, and our very own Library Foundation. Next slide, please. So where are we now in terms of implementing the digital inclusion plan? Our school-based hotspot programs are in place through summer 2021. Public hotspot circulation is a changing metric, but we are seeing more and more demand with 90% checkout of all hotspots across the branches, partners, and outreach programs 
as of last week. 600 Chromebooks and 120 iPads began circulating the week of April 19. We have worked with 23 partners through our community-based organization hotspot referral program and hosted 14 targeted hotspot outreach events with our maker spaceship. Three access east side attendance areas are now operational with coverage for 89,000 residents. Three more are in design and will soon be in construction for an additional 168 residents. 68,000 residents connected. The final two attendance areas are in planning stages and will move to design soon. Nine library branches and seven community centers now have strengthened and expanded outdoor Wi-Fi as an additional connectivity option. Coverage at each location includes the parking lots, public spaces, and areas within 100 yards of access points for the public to safely access. Throughout this time, the libraries Family Learning Centers have been conducting digital literacy classes via Zoom and online tools. Each cohort uh, provides eight hours of instruction. From November 2020 to April 2021, eight cohorts have completed the program, four in English and four in Spanish. From May through August of this year, the plan is to host at least one cohort per month per language for a total of 12 cohorts, four in Spanish, four in Vietnamese, and four in English. The Digital Inclusion Fund Round 2 is in process and will be coming to Council in a few weeks for consideration and award of the next round of grants. And I'll pass it back to Jill. Thanks, Anne. In the next fiscal year and beyond, the proposed focus is on continuing support for our schools and students by working with each district to understand their plans for the 21-22 academic year. Continuing circulation of public hotspots and computing devices through the library. Construction and completion of the three more attendance areas in the Access Eastside Network, completing funding agreements for the remaining two attendance areas and developing sustainability plans for the network as a whole. Enhancing Wi-Fi and additional community centers to support both resident use and digital literacy programming. Enhancing community awareness of the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program and support for residents to reap this benefit, possibly partnering with other efforts and the strategies to reach communities around vaccinations or health-related opportunities. And round three of the Digital Inclusion Fund grant programs. All along, we will continue to adapt to federal and state resources and programs and uh, adapt new programs to meet the, our community's needs. That concludes our update. We'll pass it on. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Anne. We're going to go now to uh, child care, learning pods, and beyond with uh, John Cicerelli and Hal um, Spengenberg, who are going to take us through what they are doing now and what they plan to do next and later in this important area. John, it's all you. Thanks, Kip. Um, Hal Spangenberg, he's our interim division manager, but he's also the assistant director for the branch. He's going to walk through these slides of where we are and where we're going um, and what our thoughts are uh, heading into the future. Hal, take it away. Thanks, John. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council and members of the public. Um, like John said, uh, my name is Hal Spangenberg. I'm the interim division manager for uh, PRNS and also serve as the assistant director of the child care branch and the emergency operations center. Uh, this evening, I'm joined by John Cicerelli, the director of PRNS and also the director of the child care branch, along with Laura Buzo, who is a recreation superintendent um, from PRNS. Since the onset of the pandemic and the development of the EOC child care branch, uh, Parks, Recreation, Neighborhood Services Department and the library have collaborated together to serve 1,970 unduplicated youth between the ages of 3 and 18 years old through a variety of virtual and in-person child care programming. These programs have served families across 41 different zip codes and have included such programs as summer camps, full day learning pods that support distance learning and preschool programs. Next slide. Current child care operations include preschool programs for children between the ages of three to five, there are six stable in-person cohorts and six virtual cohorts operating throughout the city. There are also 38 stable cohorts across 19 City of San Jose community centers, libraries, and park locations, serving over 400 youth in grades K through eight in a full day program supporting distance learning and providing enrichment and physical activity. This program has been granted an emergency waiver that allows us to continue operations until June 21st. 
of this year. Our grant funded after school education and safety program, otherwise known as ACES, is operating a virtual program serving 101 elementary and middle school youth across four locations. Lastly, we have three stable teen cohorts operating at three locations, serving youth between the ages of 12 to 18 years old and are working on expanding teen programs in the summer. Next slide. The EOC Child Care Branch has been instrumental in supporting youth and families in the most impacted areas and those dealing with child care issues and barriers to distance learning. A total of $8.72 million has been distributed through scholarships for programs and in support of child care programs and providers. Along with the $2.83 million utilized in scholarship funding to provide programs at no cost, $5.89 million was distributed to support the following. <clears throat> First five, Santa Clara County provided child care scholarship funding for qualified low income households with children under the age of five who reside in San Jose and were affected by COVID-19. Stabilization grants were provided to qualified licensed family chair home, home child care home providers operating in the city of San Jose and the conversion of part day slots to full day for up to 340 students in San Jose who were extremely low income, unsheltered with disabilities or those in foster care. Additionally, calming kits and access to the inclusion support warm line services were provided. Over 300 staff support the child care branch and programs daily. Over 79,000 meals and snacks have been provided to youth in programming, and we are currently ramping up for 65 summer cohorts at 26 community center, library, and park locations this summer. Next slide, please. PRNS and the library have worked to establish cohort locations based on highest needs using an equity lens. We have leveraged our relationship with the school city collaborative and school districts to support families most in need by building and utilizing a referral network for students identified and referred through school administrators. Recently, both PRNS and the library have submitted proposals to the Congressional Subcommittee on Labor, Health and Human Services, requesting funding to support the expansion of PRNS and library programs and services specifically around early education quality standards, digital inclusion, virtual learning, and caregiver support. PRNS is currently working on two manager's budget addendums in response to requests from San Jose City Council inquiries, and is working on expanding the collection of demographic information through our registration database system to help inform budget, scholarship, and programming decisions. Next slide. Preparation and registration for summer programming has begun. Camp San Jose Strong is a full day camp option for youth between the ages of five to 12, and Camp San Jose Strong Junior is a half day camp for youth between the ages of three to five. Through the budgeted PRNS scholarship funds and the additional community development block grant funding, these programs are offered at no cost for families that qualify, and a priority registration period has been set up for those scholarship families. The branch has promoted these programs through a variety of means, including school districts, the network of providers that we have established during the current child care study with the University of North Carolina Greensboro, city council offices, flyers, and social media. 40 hours of staff training per leader will be administered to prepare for summer. Trainings include topics that cover areas in health and safety, social emotional learning, inclusion support, and games to promote physical activity for youth who might have lost opportunities to play during the normal school year. 200 plus part-time employees were, will participate in summer training. Next slide. Our plans for next and the 2021-2022 school year are in anticipation of schools reopening to their traditional models and the department restarting their 24 after-school programs, San Jose Recreation Preschool and 12 teen centers. In a continued effort to support our families with school-aged children, we will use community development block grant funding to help cover the cost of ROC after school program. The funding will support the remaining 65% to support the 35% citywide scholarship to continue providing financial assistance to those families impacted by COVID. Next slide. Looking forward to next summer and fiscal years to come, the department will look to identify funding to continue to support vulnerable families with increased scholarship opportunities. PRNS and the library will continue their collaboration with the Intergovernmental Relations Office to identify any federal and state funding to support child care programs. The department will look to complete the current child care study with the University of North Carolina Greensboro and the Human Resources Department classification study to inform budget and child care decisions as we emerge from COVID-19. 
Lastly, PRNS will look to convert our child care supervisor from a one-time position to an ongoing position in order to build back better. Thank you. Thank you, Hal. Thank you, John. I'm going to transition now to Andrea Flores Shelton, who's going to talk a little bit about um, a unifying approach to place-based work that sh uh, she has been leading and developing along with our GIS team and many of the other folks you've heard present. Andrea? Thank you for giving me the council here. Your mic is cutting in and out an awful lot. So let's try that, see if we can do a little sound check here. Your visual is fine, but it was just your audio. How about that? That is fantastic. Wonderful. Okay, exhale. Okay, let's start again. <laughs> um, good evening, Mayor, Council, and members of the public. Um, yes, I'm Andrea Flores Shelton. I'm with Parks, Recreation, Neighborhood Services, and I've been acting as the Community and Economic Recovery Director. I've had the joy of working with people across many departments on many projects over the last several months. And for this project, I've had the privilege of working with the members of the team that you see here on this slide as we have started to plan our place-based approach into recovery. I want to thank them for their time and talents. You've heard repeatedly tonight from city leaders how racial equity is at the forefront of our transition. And while we know that people of color live throughout the city, we also know that a place-based approach is key to building an intentional focus on the recovery and resiliency of our neighborhoods especially those that have been and are disadvantaged by systems and resources through exclusionary policies and practices. Next slide. So what is a place-based approach? It has four key elements. It is a way to concentrate resources and integrate strategies, programs, and services that you've heard about tonight in agreed upon location to achieve results. Secondly, it links strategies for people and places to a clear vision. It recognizes that place, the built environment, our homes, our streets, our parks and retail are as important to achieving positive outcomes as our direct services. Third, a place-based approach aims to be a transformational process rather than transactional, meaning that residents are at the center. And we, the city, acknowledge that perhaps the current ways of doing business might not work for the desired results. So these first three are big and complex. The fourth element of a place-based approach is more manageable and where our team began, using the neighborhood as our base level of analysis to understand the conditions of the environment and the circumstances of those people living in it. As I laid out back in December when discussing how we might assess our recovery efforts um, to understand whether people and places are better off, we knew that we needed the tools and the data to understand, to prioritize and assess at the neighborhood level. Next slide. So our first step in our place-based approach is to map every neighborhood in the city by creating a boundary and identifying a name that resonates best with it. We started with neighborhoods that have been identified as communities of concern by the Metropolitan Transportation Agency and started an east to west path. Due to tight timelines, we started this process workshopping with internal city staff who live in these neighborhoods and have professional knowledge. And as you can see, it's currently incomplete, but we plan to iterate and complete it. And as we do complete parts of the city, we will then meet with council offices and the mayor's office to review and update. This is the beginning of an iterative process and of this prototype neighborhood map. And of course, we will be open to resident feedback on the boundaries and names. Next slide. Our next step, um, you'll see here, um, a portion of the neighborhood map in a near view, you'll see where we've used single census blocks or a tract, which is made up of blocks to define neighborhoods. In some cases, a neighborhood may not fit neatly in its own census block group or may get swallowed up into a small unit. So in those cases, we've made sure to call out both names, such as Doburn and Capitol Park, or Tropicana and Lanai. The use of the census block group al allows us to assess demographic, environmental, and economic indicators in a repeatable and consistent way to assess over time. Next slide. So finally, the point of this effort is not to name neighborhoods. It's to prioritize the neighborhoods for our collective strategy 
and deepen our engagement and develop a common understanding of the issues our residents are experiencing and how our interventions are making those better, worse, or the same. And by overlaying data with neighborhoods, the priority, priori prioritization process begins. And as you've seen tonight, Library, Office of Economic Development, and others use this process at the program level. And here we have an overlay of the Equity Atlas data developed by the Office of Racial Equity overlaid onto our neighborhoods. The Equity Atlas currently highlights basic demographic indicators of race and income and integrates national best practices from PolicyLink, GARE, and others. And while we know data does have limitations, using these data resources can help us compare and contrast the disparities that we might not naturally see and are not visible based on our city or community experience. It may highlight a community with a particular language access barrier or help us find a grassroots partner or community asset that we have previously not connected with. So finally, an overview of what's next on our place-based approach process. We'll continue to prototype the neighborhood uh, maps, and then we'll go through an adoption process with our assessment data sources and the outcome indicators with the Office of Racial Equity and City Recovery Departments. We'll utilize the map to determine the neighborhoods for our recovery efforts, and in a later stage, convene and collaborate with multi-sector teams. And with that, Kip, back to you. Thank you, Andrea. So as we've said, with the increasing availability of vaccines and the massive vaccination campaign underway, we can see the end of the emergency in sight. But over the next, and over the next three months in particular, the city of San Jose will be transitioning from an emergency response posture with a fully activated emergency operations center or EOC to the beginning of community and economic recovery. Integrating our recovery efforts into the city organization will entail demobilizing most of the EOC, winding down response functions and transitioning recovery functions into departments. This will be the biggest and most complicated realignment of service delivery that the city has ever undertaken, spanning 18 functions and touching almost every single city department. I want to take just a quick minute to describe the internal organizational shift we will undertake as we move the organization from a focus on emergency response to community and economic recovery. The emergency operations center structure is guided by the incident command system as in, as, and is intended to be modular, flexible, with the ability to expand and contract to face the evolving threats and opportunities presented by any disaster. The role of the EOC is to provide strategic and operational support to field operations while allowing them tactical autonomy and ensuring unity of effort and a clear line of reporting. The EOC is led by the EOC director and the management uh, uh, section, whose role is to be the thinker anticipating the needs of the field. The management section shown here in black is empowered to create teams as needed to bring in the genius of the organization, the people with the right skills, regardless of rank or department, put them together and put them against problems and opportunities as they are emerging. The resulting cross-departmental teams that are formed have a clear governance structure and are given an area of responsibility with a great deal of autonomy and the ability to call on support and resources as needed. These teams, many of which you've heard from today, can be tremendously successful. We grew the EOC organization from an initial team of about eight in January to an EOC structure that encompassed over 750 people, and in fact, more if you include the field operations. We borrowed agile methodologies such as roadmaps, objectives as measured by key results, OKRs, and Scrum from the tech world to create a more nimble operation and allow for better coordination among teams especially where levels of emergency management training were inconsistent. So very quickly, this included an extensive emergency public information officer team with strong language capabilities that were developed uh, to a stronger and stronger degree over time. A liaison branch dedicated to staying in coordination with Marin Council and our partners in other organizations, as well as standing up a local assistance team. A massive operations section that oversaw most of the day-to-day -day work from continuity of essential op services to childcare, food necessities, and homeless support. And keeping this running in the right direction and in coordination across all the units and documenting the effort as required by FEMA, 
uh, was the very competent plan section. We also had to ensure a supply of materials from PPE to IT supplies and all sorts of su supplies for each of the branches. They and staffed up a full logistics section to, to do this work as well as the work of refitting and outfitting new facilities across the city. In addition, not shown here was the extremely important work of the fiscal and administration sections and the recovery section. The EOC has allowed us to build an organization as big as the city of Hayward from scratch with over 20 new teams formed to deliver new and innovative services. The trick now is to demobilize that and return the thrust of the work back to city departments. For that effort, we have our city roadmap. The EOC is, was never intended as a permanent structure. And in fact, the EOC has lasted far longer than any previous EOC and longer than anyone in the profession, frankly, ever expected an EOC to be functioning. So now we begin this transition to recovery. And to do that, we begin with the end in mind of fostering an equitable recovery to a better normal. The city roadmap provides us with clarity on the 18 most important response and recovery initiatives that will continue into next year and where we are beginning to transition these functions from an EOC model I just explained to an approach that integrates them back into the work of city departments and the core work day to day of the city. I'll take a quick tour of this here with my fake laser pointer. Um, and if I can get it to work, there it is. Uh, you can see here, a lot of these efforts will fold back into our HR department and our IT departments. Um, this will fold back into each department, primarily being responsible for the continuity of services. Federal and state stimulus advocacy will stay within the city manager's office, intergovernmental relations. Beautify SJ will fold back into parks, recreation, neighborhood services, but maintain a cross-departmental um, effort for quite some time. Housing and sheltering continue to be led by our housing and uh, department with a number of partners. Our vaccine task force will actually stay in the EOC until it is demobilized because it is an emergency management function. And then the six uh, functions that you heard from today, housing stabilization, reemployment and workforce development, small business recovery, food necessities distribution, digital equity, child care and learning pods will all be folded back into the departments as well. But in addition, they'll have a, an overarching structure that will help guide them and us as we move forward with community and economic recovery. And that structure will look a little bit like this. So as you can see, each of the pink items that was on the roadmap has been translated into here on this chart and absorbed by one uh, of the departments as a lead. So the primary departments that will be leading this work from an external standpoint are housing, parks, recreation, neighborhood services, library, office of economic development. And you've heard from Jackie and John and Jill and Nancy, as well as their teams tonight. In addition, very more behind the scenes, but equally important are our budget team led by Jim Shannon, finance led by Julia Cooper and the office of emergency management led by Ray Reardon which will continue to have important uh, recovery functions, especially when it comes to money, documentation, and follow-up. Together, these will collectively form a community and economic recovery working group that will uh, report through into Dave through Deputy City Manager uh, Rosalind Huey and myself. And we will also be building out a small but mighty uh, CMO, City Manager's Office recovery team, to continue on some of the uh, data and performance work, the federal and state advocacy, as well as supporting our capabilities around communications and community engagement, and making sure that in coordination with our communications team, we have that strong ability to outreach in many languages and engage in many languages. We'll also be, as we'll talk about shortly, convening a, a COVID-19 recovery task force and working with a range of community partners, uh, including all of the many ones you saw on the slides, from foundations to the county to schools and many others. The other thing that we'll be transitioning is that you'll see more of the work of the roadmap and more of the work related to COVID going through the department, excuse me, the council committees first, rather than coming directly and entire, entirely to city council as a whole. 
So uh, Community and Economic Development Committee, Neighborhood Services and Education Committee, and the Smart Cities and Service Improvements Committee will all have pieces of this community and economic recovery work, as well as, of course, the council as a whole. So uh, in addition to all of that, we will be simultaneously working to support our workforce that is as exhausted as our community is from almost a year and a half of sustained high tempo, high intensity emergency response. We will be, as we spoke about earlier, resuming office work and reopening city facilities, preparing for summer programs and the pin up demand for events and activities, completing the city budget process, aligning the budget to the new city roadmap, and recommending an initial allocation of the American Rescue Plan funds in support of the recovery efforts, as well as continuing to plan for persistent and pernicious threats, including work on wildfire and power shutoffs, advancing the soft story retrofit program to prepare for the inevitable earthquake. In conclusion, over the next three months, the city will transition from emergency response to community recovery. As has been described, integrating our recovery efforts into the city organization will entail demobilizing most of the EOC, winding down response functions, and transitioning recovery functions into departments. We will do that in a way that ensures knowledge transfer and continuity of effort and stays open to changing our approach as the realities in the field and our neighborhood change and as we adapt um, to support the people in our community who have borne the burden of this pandemic. I cannot overstate how complicated this will be and how critical the teams and the department directors are to the success of this effort as the staffs and units shift and move forward. To conclude our, our presentation on community and economic recovery, we, we did want to conclude with some questions um, and basically three things that we, we in particular wanted to ask you, though of course we're open to all feedback and questions that you have. First question we were most interested in is, if the city is to intentionally focus on hard hit neighborhoods in downtown, what might be the benefits or challenges to a place-based approach? Second question, what does a COVID-19 recovery task force mean to you? Third question, to build back better, what policy and system changes should be part of our focus? So that concludes our presentation and I'll turn it over to Dave Sykes, our city manager to close us out and then we will go back to mayor and council for public comment and conversation. Dave? Yeah, thank you. I um, wanna thank Rosalind and Kip for leading the effort and really all the work of everyone who um, participated tonight, but also behind the scenes and leading up to this. Um, uh, you know, I, I can't emphasize enough the points that Kip made there at the end in terms of how important it is that we are able to integrate uh, this recovery work into our, our normal uh, departmental structure. It is key for our success moving forward as there's gonna be continued demand for us to resume all the services that we provide as a city. So um, I'll leave it at that for now and certainly appreciate uh, the input of the council and mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Kip. Thanks to all the members of the team. Uh, okay, we're going to go first to the public and we're going to come back to the council for uh, questions and discussion. My screen seems to be losing the list. Here we go. Uh, Dana, uh, welcome. Um, good evening, um, Mayor Licardo and council members. I'm Dana Bennett from Kiss and Common, and um, we've been leading for the last um, several years the Opportunity Youth Partnership which has been um, focused on, uh, which is a collective impact effort focused on um, improving education and employment outcomes for young people not connected to school nor work. Sometimes a crisis opens the door to opportunity. The pandemic and the resulting economic collapse showed us how disconnected and inequitable our education to employment system is and how economically vulnerable black, indigenous, Latinx and other students of color are not well served by it. There are many relatively successful safety net and job programs in Santa Clara County and San Jose. However, the region has not been able to create a structurally integrated, connected education to employment system. We need an end-to-end -end personalized workforce development program through a structured coalition of workforce programs, public support services, 
private employers, labor unions, community colleges, adult schools, financial institutions, and entire economic sectors. While some of the, some promising employment strategies have been presented tonight, I hope as San Jose builds its roadmap to recovery, it leaves behind the status quo and examines how its education and employment system can be integrated and scaffolded to create a high quality end-to-end -end education to employment system that addresses the current inequities in the system and makes it easy for young adults um, to engage in education and training, easy to persist in that education and training, and easy to step into living wage employment and life success. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Thank you for your work. Uh, Joseph Harity. Greetings, council members uh, and staff. My name is Joe Harity. I'm a resident of San Jose District 6, and I've been on the front lines of youth development and workforce development efforts in the city for the past 16 years. I'm here in my role as the director of the Opportunity Youth Partnership, which you heard Dana just mention. Additionally, I'm involved in the Bridge to Recovery as a steering committee member and a work group chair. I'm an advocate for young people. My comments reflect my commitments to support the creation of a true opportunity ecosystem for youth and young adults. As such, I deeply appreciate the focus at the outset of this presentation, particularly the intention to be guided by the wisdom of community. A recent report by Mathematica notes that the unemployment rate for young adults was more than double that of adults in the pandemic with even higher rates for youth of color. Young people need us. They need our best. I am concerned that we are readying ourselves to design more one-off unintegrated programs that aren't built to respond to the complexities of the lives of, of black and brown youth and young adults. We cannot program our way out of the inequity COVID forced us to take account of. Young folks don't need another program, let alone programs that aren't connected. To build back better, young people need an opportunity ecosystem. And San Jose actually has many pieces of the opportunity ecosystem in place. Now those pieces must be tightly woven together into a seamless system. The Opportunity Youth Partnership has been working on these very issues for the past eight years. In the pandemic, we have sharpened our focus. We are zeroed in on data-driven service connections and youth leadership. We want to make sure that going back to school also means connecting to an integrated system of supports and that young leaders co-design the services they must produce. Specifically on youth leadership, systems and programs must partner with those who hold the expertise of lived experience. Young leaders must be co-designers if we are to meet the moment of racial justice and equity. You'll hear from just such a young leader in a bit, my colleague, Sophia Jaquez. To this end, we have partnered with a small set of workforce, uh, Work to Future board members to co-host a youth forum with more than 50 participants, including seven young leaders who will co-create an integrated youth workforce development strategy. That is, lay the groundwork for an opportunity ecosystem in San Jose. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And Sophia, you have quite an introduction. Hi. Um, yes. Yes, I work with Joe. Um, I would describe myself as a advocate for organizations like Teen Success Inc. who assist teen mothers, San Jose Conservation Corps, um, and Opportunity Youth Partnership. I am an alumni for all of these programs myself and through my insight and experience, I have been able to give some great input on how we can improve these programs to actually become more effective for more youth. Um, Currently, uh, we have a Young Leaders Council started about a year ago from Opportunity Youth Partnership, where we bring in lots of other young leaders that represent their own nonprofit organizations in Santa Clara County. Currently, we are discussing housing because it's one of the biggest issues that is restricting youth from post-secondary education and focusing on their goals. Right now, we're actually uh, connecting with a Tiny Homes Project. My CEO of San Jose Conservation Corps, Dorsey Moore, has been a, such a great advocate in uh, connecting us to the Tiny Homes Project and actually um, getting us a seat at the table with people like the mayor, uh, working with city and county folks to start bringing these youth to the discussion and talking about our experience just to push that pressure on creating more affordable housing for youth. Um, I believe that if we focus a lot more on the housing and supportive youth services, I could see potentially breaking these ongoing cycles of poverty in the most vulnerable communities, such as the one I was raised in Eastside San Jose. Um, so yeah, great work is going on. Um, a, a lot of young leaders are out here really representing for their communities, um, sharing their stories. 
And I have a lot of optimism for the future. And I just want to say thank you to our um, great people who work for our city and everything you guys described earlier and all of the help that you guys have been doing. I've been really been seeing it as someone who works in the nonprofit world. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you for your work. Uh, Roland? Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. I have a quick question to the Mayor and Council. It's whether staff have evaluated the price and performance of Star Starlink for the rapid deployment of broadband infrastructure on the east side. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brinkman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, to, to ask about, you know, I tend to have a more, uh, a larger view of these sort of things, a more abstract view that I hope can be incredibly relevant and helpful though to, to more exact uh, you know, practices you go through. Um, to, to start off with more exact practices that you go through, uh, I hope it's the future of digital divide issues that you know, bridging the digital divide is a lot to do. And I, I just hope that they can be willing to want to work with open public policy ideas that I think it, it doesn't have to be an adversarial relationship. It's a relationship that can be kind of a hand in hand to really, I think it better considers the future of what is sustainability for our local communities and for our country. And please consider it. Um, with the ideas of work to future, um, union uh, ideas weren't mentioned, union apprenticeship ideas for young people. Where, where is that sort of thinking? It used to be there and it should still be there. Uh, just to mention those two things, uh, with 52 seconds left, I wanted to really thank yourselves, and you, you, this was a great item today, it really brought focus to myself how I can work and think this summer. You know, basically you have a bunch of good ideas and programs starting out that we have been working on continuously way before COVID-19. And we're just simply continuing our good practices, our good human rights, good workers' rights, good civil rights issues. And that's important stuff. And that's how we build our sustainable future. And uh, so thank you for that. And I mean, I'm trying to learn how to address these things in, in you know, large scale questions of how do we uh, respect the future of federal funding? Can we accept that and be comfortable with it? We need to learn how to do that. And once we all can learn how to do that, things can move better, I think. Uh, good luck on those efforts. Thank you. Uh, the person with the phone number ending 5140. Good evening, everybody. Um, I want, I like the, the city council to first of all, try to thank the taxpayer once in a while, because that's how all these programs are going to be paid for. It's just not money that falls out of the sky. With a down economy, uh, where's this money going to come from is what I want to know. A lot, of, a lot of for lease, for rent, for sale signs and businesses everywhere. Where's the money going to come from? Nobody's really – you've talked about a lot of things with 5 and $10 words, but uh, how's it, who's going to pay for it? I, I would like to hear how that's going to happen. Secondly – if they want people to learn how to do something, what they need to do is send people to the Rose Garden that I'm at right now and fix the fountain. Are you listening, Dev Davis? The fountain is broken again. If you're going to be in charge of the water for this new Google village, Thank you. you need to learn how to. Uh, Hillary Thorson. Hello, I'm Hillary Thorson. I'm the Library and Education Commissioner for District 6. And we've done updates during our commission meetings from the library this past year on their work leading the city's digital inclusion efforts. And I wanted to say that they have really done an amazing job. The pandemic has shown the huge gaps within our community in terms of digital access. And the library has led the way in making the city more inclusive and equitable, enabling children, parents, seniors, and job seekers to have access to digital resources. I truly believe that if your goal is to get every resident in San Jose the digital and educational resources they need to succeed in whatever stage of life they're in, if you give the library the resources to do it, they will make it happen. So I'm urging you to support this work to the fullest extent possible. It will help the black and brown communities most affected by the pandemic and the city itself recover faster 
and help our residents stay in the city and get jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Gisela, good to hear from you. Welcome. Hi, Mayor Licardo. Hello, everyone on the council. Thank you for your time this evening. Um, I had the pleasure to be a part of a lot of the meetings that helped bring this document uh, to you all and have very much appreciated uh, the generosity and support, not only of the time of your city staff, but also of the funding that you have provided uh, to Loaves and Fishes uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. However, the problems that we were facing uh, with the, house, uh, the homeless and the hungry throughout our community were already very extensive prior to the uh, start of the pandemic. We were looking at finishing last fiscal year at going from 547,000 meals to about 800,000 meals. We ended up serving over a million meals. And next month, we will have served 1.4 million meals. The reason I bring this up <clears throat> is because the reality is COVID is not done with us. Uh, our numbers have not leveled, have not dropped one bit. Um, and we just continue to see the impact of, of the pandemic. We are now going forward facing um, a situation that is literally four times worse than it was just a year ago. So um, the rhetoric is all here of what we know we need to do collectively in order to move things forward for the most vulnerable throughout our community. We now have to have the, the will to actually do that, to continue to fund those organizations that, as you've described us, we are the last line of defense for the most vulnerable among us. Um, so being able to continue this partnership that we've gone and deepened further with the city of San Jose is really paramount for us. And we are looking forward to continuing to move things forward for those who need our services the most. It's also why we're working to try and build our next commercial kitchen here in the city of San Jose. We know what that partnership can mean, uh, not only to our community, but to all of those surrounding our community. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Gisela, and thank you for your great work. Uh, Catherine Hedges. Um, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that the Rose Garden Fountain has been perfectly functional and clean every time I've been over there. And um, it looks like all the streets around it are newly paved. And um, regarding the presentation and the plans, I thought it was a great presentation. I'm really glad the city is doing so much for um, the um, under. I'm forgetting my words here, but anyway, the people who need the most help in San Jose. Um, there is one omission, and that's that San Jose still doesn't have an ADA coordinator or an Office of Disability Affairs to make sure that all these new programs actually are inclusive of disabled people. And we need to get that sooner rather than later so that we don't have to reverse a whole bunch of policies that were made wrong from the start. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Nick, welcome. Uh, hello, Mayor Licardo and honorable members of the council. My name is Nick Kawada, and I am the policy director for the Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits. In consultation with the Racial Equity Action Leadership Coalition, we present to you several important community principles around ensuring an equitable recovery. And we actually have 58 nonprofits who also signed in support. Uh, we uh, previously submitted that to you all. Uh, so first, federal rescue funding is the people's money. Second, local governments should not seek to go back to the way things were, but should strive towards building a more equitable future for our community. Lastly, the scale of federal resources should be viewed as an opportunity to make breakthrough achievements in critical areas, such as alleviating the racial, ethnic, economic, and other disparities that produced so much death and suffering during the pandemic. In addition to these guidelines, uh, guiding principles, we feel that the following must also occur. Uh, federal rescue, rescue funding and federal recovery plans should be highly transparent to the general public, including dashboards and accessible instructions about how to provide input in decision-making processes. Funds should be used in a way that furthers racial justice. Uh, the county and cities should work together on uh, recovery planning and expenditures so that the, their efforts are complementary and not duplicative. Uh, there should be a, a coordinated effort within all jurisdictions uh, and including other entities like educational entities, transportation agencies, and public utilities. The community should be brought to the table meaningfully using numerous different accessible avenues. Community-based organizations can be excellent partners to support government's efforts to reach community members with relevant lived experiences. 
establishing a coordinated council that reflects the needs and views of all who live and work in Santa Clara County and can gather community input about strategic investments in our, you know, in our better future, identify gaps, make sure all voices heard, make recommendations, and then track results. Thank you very much. Thank you. Christine Fitzgerald, welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council members and community members. I cannot uh, uh, concur more with everybody that has spoken before me. Um, I've worked in the nonprofit sector for many years in many different roles, helping people uh, gain education in um, how to use a computer, how to be a good entrepreneur, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> Building back better should also include nothing about us without us. What I mean by this is those of us with disabilities should always be at the table. Um, an Office of Disability Affairs and a Commission on Disability would help the city far more than what we've been trying to cobble together as a unified body um, <clears throat> community-based organization structure. Please consider um, looking at the Office of Disability Affairs and uh, Commission on Disability and including those of us with disabilities at the table. I don't know why we keep being pushed away from the table, but darn it, I want at the table. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, events, SVH, I think that's Matthew. That is now known as Events, SVH. Matthew Reed from Silicon Valley at home. Um, Mayor, council, staff, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I'd be remiss not to acknowledge the tremendous amount of work that's been done over this period. And I know you, you receive this acknowledgement, but it's really important to, to recognize the work that the city's done in partnership through this process. Um, I want to speak briefly to some of the housing pieces. Um, we believe that the at-risk households is growing from the number that you received. Um, and this, this is going to be additionally complicated by the fact that not everybody is going to be back at work uh, when the moratorium um, is lifted. The reality is that rent relief is not going to prevent evictions throughout the city. Um, this is an incredibly uh, complex environment. Everybody's situation is, is in its own way unique. Um, and so we really support the, the proposal to focus on housing stabilization. We also think it's really critical to, to lean into the idea of an eviction assistance center. Um, that would provide a range of uh, full support to, to address the complexity of both the resources that are available um, and the needs and be able to make referrals in a way um, that will take pressure off of the system by creating efficiencies, because we're very concerned that the current system of the courts is just not prepared um, for what is coming. Finally, I want to acknowledge that <clears throat> uh, affordable housing is infrastructure um, we saw through this pandemic that the greatest vulnerability was in areas where there was overcrowding and severe rent burden. What I didn't see in this proposal is a long-term solution to that problem that the city has faced for a while. And I, I would urge you to lean into this as an opportunity to come out of this better than when we started. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey Buchanan. Uh, Mayor and Council, good evening. Uh, Jeffrey Buchanan on behalf of Working Partnerships USA. Uh, certainly want to want to start off by just thanking uh, city staff. Uh, there's just a tremendous amount of work that's been done by, by our essential workers here in the city uh, responding to this disaster. And I think, you know, certainly from the uh, from management to uh, those uh, uh, who've been on the front lines, uh, you all deserve a, a huge amount of credit. And certainly, you know, as we think about recovery, we can't we can't ignore the impact that uh, ensuring that this city continues to provide essential services to uh, the residents of, of our community, what that plays in economic recovery. The data is pretty clear uh, when it comes to local governments, 
uh, cutting staff, uh, pursuing furloughs, uh, looking at layoffs. Uh, it's been it's been highly correlated the those types of activities and uh, the prolonging of economic recessions. Uh, as we look at our recovery, we really also need to make sure we're thinking about uh, how, how what 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 our policies are looking like in, in relation to the city workforce and what are we doing to ensure job quality. Uh, certainly, the you know from digital equity to workforce development uh, to uh, housing justice. Uh, this report's laid out a number of important strategies, uh, but really uh, coming out of this recovery, I think a, you know, another uh, speaker spoke to this, we need to really think about uh, the role of workers and working families. What are we doing not just to uh, promote uh, workforce development or, or some of the types of service programs that were ID'd here by staff, but really improving job quality, which you know, some of that can be through programmatic means, but some of that can be through policy means, things uh, like expanding on the city's efforts around paid sick days, for instance. Uh, when we think about our, our work uh, in housing justice, certainly would encourage the, the city to continue looking at the issue of, of utility debt in addition to rent debt, uh, legal services for tenants facing eviction, uh, and continuing to, to deal with the uh, uh, code enforcement issues that we've seen really rise in recent months. Uh, Thank you. Amanda Dickey. Amanda, it appears your device is muted right now. There you go. Thank you. Amanda Dickey, Director of Government Relations at the Santa Clara County Office of Education. I wanna start by thanking the city for your active partnership with the county office to support our community during the COVID-19 pandemic. Specifically, we are proud to have been a partner of yours in providing meals, supporting childcare, and expanding internet connectivity in neighborhoods across the city. As you plan a recovery strategy, we urge you to focus on three key principles. First, rebuilding um, efforts and funds should be targeted in those neighborhoods and communities most impacted by the pandemic, not just because they have suffered the most, but because that's where the greatest needs are and the inequities that create those needs. For instance, as you complete your evaluation um, that was discussed earlier around neighborhood needs, one question that we would we would like to collaborate on is, you know, do your new do your lowest income neighborhoods and um, neighborhoods that are historically communities of color, do they have high quality early learning centers and how have uh, child care providers in those neighborhoods been impacted? Um, second, we would echo the Silicon Valley Community Foundation's comments regarding strategic investments of one-time funds in ways that create ongoing long-term benefits by building an infrastructure of opportunity through investments um, like broadband access and childcare facilities. And finally, we would encourage you to continue to expand and strengthen the partnerships with other agencies and organizations that the city has created during the pandemic, including the fruitful partnership that we have enjoyed um, with you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's uh, take it back to the council for questions and comments. Councilmember Perales? Yeah, thank you, Mayor and um, really appreciate the detailed presentation from staff. Um, clearly the amount of, of time um, and energy uh, that went into that uh, showed through uh, in the collective effort on the presentation there, but I think more so as we know, uh, that has been demonstrated this past year on the collective effort from, from staff that have assumed emergency operation roles and uh, that we will continue to uh, to assume as we move forward uh, and into recovery. And I think we have a lot of lessons that uh, we have learned throughout this past year that we can apply to these next phases of, uh, of recovery. And certainly uh, I think that that was demonstrated in the thoroughness of the, the presentation uh, that we all were able to see. And so I, I first off wanna say uh, I, I was very happy and pleased with, with what I saw um, and what was presented. Uh, very, very thoughtful uh, in regards to preparing for our next steps. And uh, I did have a question uh, early on in the, the presentation, the first section on uh, housing, and there was a, a, a statement on the slide around uh, an eviction help center. And I wanted to see, is that is, is the idea here that this would be uh, short-lived or would we be trying to establish something maybe with community partners that would be more 
uh, ongoing and permanent. So that's the first question. Excellent question. Reagan, can you fill that for us? Hi, Council Member Reagan Hanninger with the Housing Department. Thanks for the question. The, the thought is that it's an entirely new health center and we're thinking we would sustain it for one to two years at least when we, the housing department had um, similar efforts in the, in the recession, we, we operated efforts for some time. Um, I don't see my colleague Rachel on. Oh, wait, there she is. She may want to add to this. All right, good evening, Rachel Vanderveen, um, Deputy Director with the Housing Department. Um, so, yeah, I think um, when we when we um, put together our concepts to bring forward to discuss tonight, what we were really looking at is that we would have um, six months of a full ramp up um, for the eviction help center with fully staffed. And then what we would do after that is we would just um, slowly peel off um, staff for an additional year. So it'd be a total of 18 months is what we're proposing at this time. Okay, thank you. And um, in regards to the, the use of the South Hall uh, site as a demobilization, um, uh, or I guess uh, to demobilize that, that site there, what does that look like on beginning to sort of ramp that down? Do we have a time frame for that as well? Reagan and Rachel, it's Nancy Klein, may I jump in there? Sure. Um, we, we are working with the housing staff with Team San Jose to determine timing, uh, which considers the events that may be occurring at the convention center. So that is something we're working on literally as we speak and we can get back to you with more definite timing. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, certainly a number of other, I think, great opportunities in in the other sectors. And, and I think I'll, I'll skip over to giving some feedback uh, because I think a lot of this can also be covered and, and inclusive of our community voice as we uh, we look at, at building up a, a citywide task force. And so I'll give some, some feedback um, in, in that regard. So I, I wanted to, to first say, and I, I appreciated comments from uh, community members, and I think uh, they were spot on uh, in, in a lot of, of, of how we should build that out. And uh, number one, I think that the focus of the task force should primarily be to include community stakeholder voices uh, so that they help develop a firsthand equitable recovery strategy and policy recommendations. Uh, similarly, as we've been able to, to build out of the uh, Health and Racial Equity Task Force led by Councilmember Carrasco and the Greater Downtown Economic Recovery Task Force uh, that my office helped lead. I think having those uh, recommendations be certainly directly uh, or directly um, driven from the task force members uh, was what was most beneficial out of out of both of those efforts. And I believe that the task force membership should primarily focus on representation from the most severely impacted low income communities of color that we saw disproportionately affected during this past year. And, it, and we heard that from our community stakeholders, uh, those that spoke today. Um, and again, that's a, an area where we can take some of the lessons learned from this past year as well. I think that uh, recommendations um, again, in focus should be developed by uh, the task force and, and that those uh, voices should uh, include predominantly small business representatives uh, and business district representatives. Um, we should include uh, uh, nonprofit organizations uh, directly, those that were directly involved this last year uh, and, um, and those that will be continued or continually involved in recovery efforts such as Second Harvest, Sacred Heart, OXA, uh, Health Trust, Cisipuede Collective, uh, and Community Health Partnership. 
uh, community health clinics as well, such as Gardner, Indian Health Center, Roots, and Aki. Um, we should ensure to include workforce and employment organizations, uh, as we've already discussed in the presentation, such as Work the Future, uh, working partnerships, uh, as well as business associations, such as the Downtown Association, uh, Alum Rock Business Association, uh, and organizations like the SVO. And last but not least, uh, we should certainly uh, include arts, entertainment, and special event-based organizations and venues. Um, I, I think that that was a, a really great addition as we attempted to be uh, as inclusive as possible in the Greater Downtown Economic Recovery Task Force and, uh, and being able to include uh, those uh, organizations, I, I think, uh, proved really fruitful uh, and, and certainly inclusive. Uh, and lastly, uh, I think we heard this in the, the, the commentary, but certainly, uh, you know, th this list I've, I've provided is just suggestive. Uh, it's not at all exhaustive or fully inclusive. Uh, and one of the uh, community members that spoke brought up um, ensuring to include organizations uh, that can have a voice for our uh, members of our community with disabilities. And I know that organizations such as uh, Parents Helping Parents um, were, were very vocal uh, and helpful this past year. Uh, but I do think that, that in that essence, right, as we're talking about inclusivity and, and equity, uh, we wanna be able to ensure that, that some of these more marginalized uh, or, or traditionally excluded voices that, that we're, we're not leaving them out. Um, and uh, I think as we, as we form this, this task force, uh, one of the things that helped uh, guide the efforts of uh, the Greater Downtown Economic Recovery Task Force was a smaller steering committee that helped us as we built it up uh, and, and were able to decide that. So that way, uh, maybe it wasn't fully just driven on um, uh, or it won't be fully driven on, on the council's input, uh, but we could utilize um, uh, collective voices from around this, this quickly in those areas that have been harder, harder hit. Um, and, and lastly, I do think that we need to ensure that the task force uh, and its efforts receive adequate resources in our upcoming budget so that we can ensure our staff can support the, their work uh, and that they can actually act on uh, recommendations that they will inevitably make that require funding uh, and or uh, staff time or both. Um, that's my collective feedback uh, and I appreciate again staff's um, input and look forward to hearing from my colleagues. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Arenas. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to start off by just thanking um, staff uh, and our city manager for this really wonderful approach to recovery for our city. I am very hopeful um, as I'm seeing some of the, the pillars um, as you began, um, as the presentation began, uh, I saw that this was all lined up um, around people, equity, dignity, empathy, and action. And um, this is, you know, this is um, to me the best um, type of approach um, and the principles that we we need to uphold. And so I'm really pleased to see this. I'm I'm really pleased to see. Um, the integration of, of departments within all of the different um, um, areas that we are going to address, such as housing and the economic recovery. So, so, so thank you uh, for the for the very thoughtful um, approach. Um, I I do have some questions around uh, childcare, and I'll start by saying, and I think you all heard our president. Uh, Biden um, talk about um, child care as infrastructure, but we knew this um, last year and that's why um, the, the council and the mayor, we all um, supported and approved money to, to ensure that our child care providers stabilized and also uh, to ensure that there was um, families who um, make a little bit more than what the federal um, guidance uh, says and um, and uh, disqualifies them from certain services. And these are like the gap families that we refer to. Um, and uh, and what we need to continue to do is, is uphold that so that 
um, all of our, our city can continue to recover, um, but specifically women, as women have um, carried the burden uh, traditionally in, um, in the household pre-COVID and certainly after COVID. And, um, and I'm sure uh, for the single um, moms out there, they, they are the ones who are really uh, struggling. And as we go back into school um, with all these really strange uh, schedules, as I mentioned earlier, that we are, um, uh, I know that our PRNS department is gonna be very cognizant of that and, um, and uh, puzzle in um, the needs of, of, our, of, our, um, of our families. One of, the, one of the questions I have is, let, let, how do we ensure that we are serving the, the neediest of families? And so I know that we have scholarships and they're 100%. I've been very supportive around all of that. Um, but I, I'm wondering about how do we know, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize my video was off. How do we know that these are the, 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 the hardest hit? And, um, and these are obviously families that need our support and we are providing it. But I also wanna to get to the next level where we are identifying the, the, the families that are going to say, for example, the, the emergency rental relief, the eviction help center, um, maybe the child uh, advocacy center that is um, that had just opened last month um, through the county for sexual assault uh, for children. These are all the families that I think are in dire straits. Have we thought about a system in which um, maybe the 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 emergency rental relief um, folks? refer into our PRNS department in the same way that our, our schools have been also helping us identify students. Uh, Council Member Randis Johnson, Israeli Director of PRNS. Um, I like that idea of, of finding those other avenues where we're identifying folks in need um, and cross sort of referencing these things. I think another avenue is something that I believe you were involved in recommending and we are producing an MBA on, which is the use of promotorists. Uh, alongside our project hope groups right in in communities of need as again as a way of being really almost a door-to-door -door effort of trying to identify because frankly i think we're starting to get to some level of groups where that may be the only way we reach them right mm -hmm. is meeting them talking to them um and and trying to bring them in um, because they're they're not really responding to traditional ways or maybe those traditional ways aren't getting to them um right. So I agree there's more work to do there, but I, I really like the idea of trying to start cross referencing to all these other groups of people we know that we're serving through other means like rental assistance or something and saying, hey, do you have this need too? Mm -hmm. uh, we're certainly prioritizing their enrollment into our program. So we've what we've started doing is anybody who's scholarship qualifying, which right now gives you everything free, um, there's a two or three week period where only those folks get to register. And if they're- oh, no. I yep. love it. And, and as, as frustrated as I was as a mom to, <laughs> to wait for that, um, that window, I was okay with it because I, I, I just think that that is the, the right approach. Absolutely the right approach. I, I have to um, recognize that your department has just been doing some wonderful, um, just responding to our community in ways that I'm, uh, I think will will absolutely make a difference in the long run and, and in everyday life so that our families can get back to work. So I, I really appreciate that, John. I think you and I can maybe take this off offline. Um, I, I'm going to um, move into, uh, because I do have other child care questions, but um, I can um, connect with you later, John, about that, um, because we, we need to have a um, future source um, for infrastructure for childcare as it can't just be this next year and let people go. Um, okay, so the next question I have is around um, uh, some of the, the Opportunity Youth Partnership. And I don't know if uh, Joe Herity is still, uh, is still on the line, um, Mayor. Is there any way that we can include um, Joe back into the conversation? Uh, sure. If Joe will raise his hand, I think we can fish him out. <laughs> I'm here. Hi. Uh, 
Hi, Joe. Uh, I was really, I'm really excited uh, to hear ab about all of the, the work that you're doing. Um, and, and it sounds like uh, this, this uh, very integrated uh, program approach um, is something that I have been pursuing because uh, in my pri in priority setting where our um, council voted for the things that we wanted to um, put at the forefront, I included uh, program youth alignment. Um, so that programs can work off of one another. Can you share with me um, how, what, what is this framework and, um, and have you approached our, our uh, folks um, in the city uh, to, uh, about this framework? Uh, yeah, well, th thank you for um, inviting me to, to have a little bit of a follow-up chat here. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, we, so there are several frameworks. There are, are a number of uh, cities and communities around the country um, doing incredible work uh, to really create seamless uh, integrated ecosystems. Uh, Philadelphia has a particular framework. Baltimore has a particular framework. Austin, um, LA here in California has a phenomenal system that they rolled out um, recently. Um, so I, I think there's a number of examples. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, we have shared a bit in particular, I have been a, a, a rather fierce um, advocate with Work to Future um, over the past two years and have uh, provided a, a 160 page packet uh, last May, actually about one year ago, with an immense amount of detail um, on a variety of these um, uh, particular programs. So I think there's a lot of opportunity um, to link these programs and services together. Some of it can be done with data. Some of it is through contractual alignment, inserting different pieces into RFPs. But most fundamentally, um, I think it means understanding the journey that our least resourced uh, community members need to go through and that they're almost always needing multiple pieces of program uh, to really take, uh, to, to make their journey um, uh, uh, as easy as it ought to be. And so I think there are frameworks that exist. We have been bringing this very deliberately to work to future very specifically as one component of the city. And we have been in conversation with folks uh, in the MGPTF and PRNS. Um, we've chatted with folks at the library. And I think, so there's a lot of pieces deployed and there's an incredible opportunity before us. I wonder if maybe at this point, uh, I, I don't know if Jeff Bruster is around, um, uh, but if we can have maybe a commitment, um, Dave, um, so that we can sit down and, and hear more about these frameworks that will make sense and actually bring our youth into the center. What, the other thing that really struck me about what you said, Joe, is that um, that you, you want to make sure that there is the, this consumer, that the youth as a consumer is, is connected and being asked for some feedback. Um, and, and I think that's what we really need to do instead of um, trying to figure out what to do for our youth, but ask our youth to be part of the solution. Dave, could we have a commitment to take a look at some of these frameworks um, now that we are on this road to recovery and, and see if this makes sense for us? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I really appreciated some of the comments. Um, and I don't know if Joe, uh, Jeff's on, certainly Nancy is, but um, I think just in terms of you know listening and getting perspectives of all parts of our community and especially the youth, I think as as we do this work, absolutely. And Jeff is on. Yeah. So. Yeah. Awesome. Hi, hi, everyone. Yeah. No, I I know um, Joe has been speaking a lot with Monique Melchar, who's the director of Work the Future. Joe is involved in Youth Forum. He mentioned that in his um, public comment, and it is something that we're very interested in. Um, moving forward on. So we've actually just done some labor market research as well to kind of dive deeper and hear the voice of the customer, in this case, the youth and, and our adult clients. So I think it's a good moment to really align things. Amazing. And I apologize, Jeff, I didn't see you on the screen. So, um, uh, but I'm really happy to hear. I know that you believe in the, yes, no, you don't have to worry about that. Sure. Um, uh, I know you believe in our youth. I know you want the best for our youth. We've been working really hard um, at uh, making sure that they have a brighter future. And so I really appreciate that. And I appreciate your all of the work that you've done. Um, so uh, the, the the last thing is, um, and thank you so much, Joe. I, I think uh, you know we can connect with you and figure out how to how to connect everybody. But it sounds like we we must be all connected at somehow some way. 
Um, the, the, the other piece to this, and this is my last um, bit of comment, I'll come back for my second round, but this is something that, that I'm thinking that we should also do with our uh, Latino community and our uh, community of color, that, that we should also check in with them um, to see this is our road to recovery. Are we on the right road? I mean, I, I, this is music to my ears in terms of the principles that we're following, the, 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 the recovery that, uh, path that we've chosen here. Um, but I, I think we also need to figure out whether um, our community is on board, um, at least maybe some of the stakeholders in, in some of those areas that are most impacted. Um, is there a plan to do that? I think I think this was our first step on that, and part of what we see with the with the task force is the opportunity to do that on an ongoing basis. And one of the functions that we know we need to build and strengthen is the community engagement function all the way across the board. So the, the short answer is yes, and I think we'll both do it as individual programs, but also collectively as a whole as well. So I uh, would welcome also um, additional suggestions either here or offline to think about how we might do that well and in a respectful way. So um, absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kip, and uh, congratulations, everyone. This is a, a beautiful presentation, and you can see the, the braiding of the partnerships just among all of the uh, different presenters. It just didn't really skip a beat. Um, so I'm really proud uh, to be in San Jose and part of this recovery, so thank you for your all your hard work. Thank you. Councilor Mayhead? Thanks, Mayor, and, and uh, thank you to staff for the comprehensive report, I, um, and, and especially to, to all the city staff out there on the front lines working with our community to, to build back better and, and especially make the investments where uh, in, in the communities and for the people um, that government often hasn't, hasn't served so well. So I, I, think, I think the emphasis is well placed. Um, my, my first question is to, to what extent the initiatives and which of the initiatives in here are dependent upon uh, American Recovery Act dollars versus other sources and, and to what extent they can they scale up and down with the amount of those funds what's kind of the, the status of that funding stream and, and how impact I'm, I'm imagining that's pretty central to this plan. It's absolutely critical um, without it we would still be wanting to do all of these things but honestly um, you know one of the biggest swings um, uh, a couple of months back was whether we were going to have a second round of the funds directly come into the city and uh, you know thankful to all of our taxpayers that will that will allow us to move simultaneously across all of these fronts. We'll come back with much more detail on this, or at least the initial round of detail, I should say, on the May 17th study session. But I would say without the American Rescue Plan, we would be uh, in a much, much uh, diff more difficult position. We'd have to be cutting and cutting deeply at essential services in order to handle uh, some of the bare minimum of what we need to do for recovery. And there would be no way that we could be nearly as ambitious as we are. So this is really interwoven in with the American Rescue Plan and takes that fully into account. And without it, we would be uh, several orders of magnitude um, less ambitious than what we are. Yeah, thanks. That, that's what I assumed. And on May 17th, will, will we have a sense of the scale of the funds that we'll be able to secure in these different categories, or would, will that still be premature? Yeah, we may not have them uh, down to uh, some of the categories may be grouped. There'll be some reserves some flexibility, just like we did with the coronavirus relief fund. We, we, we still need to uh, maintain some flexibility so that as the conditions emerge, we're, we're not completely bound. But you'll have a clear sense of of where the initial streams of investment will go and what we think the arc of the spending will look like. And, and really, I'm talking more about work that, that Lee and, and Jim Shannon and the team will be working on. And you'll see much more from, from Jim and Lee as well on, on that as we get closer to the, to the 17th. Great. Yeah, looking forward to seeing the, the, invest, the actual investments uh, in dollar amounts we're planning to, uh, to make, which will be great. So I'm curious, um, sort of related, on, on slide seven, where you, um, you, you kind of reoriented around this new enterprise priority, I noticed the scale at the bottom that it has priority from higher to lower with housing stabilization being first and then childcare learning pods being last. And I believe that's the prioritization uh, level that, that uh, council has given staff. But I'm curious how staff interprets that in terms of you know, what it means in practice. 
you know, does that align with dollars invested, with staff allocation, with just how we're resourcing it? With, I mean, how ambitious we're being with our goals? How, how does staff interpret the, the ordering of those six boxes that we just went through? That's a good question. And, you know, in the past, when we've had discrete projects, we viewed it pretty literally. But I would say I, I'm actually thinking about this um, differently than a, a series of discrete projects. As you've heard, and I think in many ways, most articulately from the public, you know, these things are holistic. They're, they're woven together. Somebody doesn't have a, a childcare problem on one day and a rental problem on the other day and, and a feeding problem on the third day. They typically have them all looped together in, in, in knotty, thorny, complicated ways that, 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 that we are as human beings. And so I think, um, well, obviously we're going to have to decide amongst different levels of funding, we really view this as, as sort of um, uh, pieces of the quilt that need to be stitched together and complement each other in the right way. I think what we'll be looking more for in terms of, of funding allocation is the primacy of the city in solving or addressing that issue. So there are, are some issues where, where city is more front and center and set it some issues where we are supporting our partners. And so we're gonna balance the funding more on that basis than strictly speaking the, the left to right uh, prioritization that you see. Because I, I also believe if, if you were to think about the distance of that prioritization, all of those six are very close to each other. They're all extremely important to us at this point. So uh, I, I, I've, I've sort of contradicted myself in terms of, of the prioritization framework, but I do think that that is, that is uh, we're taking a bit more holistic approach to it than we would with discrete or projects that were competing truly in terms of different segments. Okay, thanks. I think that's fair. I, I get that these challenges are interrelated and they're all really important. I, I do think to be true to the spirit of the prioritization process, it, it would be good to kind of see or to understand to what extent council's prioritization is reflected in either the ambition of the goals we're setting, the resources we're allocating, or I, there is a waiting there, it feels like to me. And if, if everything's important, nothing's that important, unfortunately. We, we do have limited resources and staff capacity, so I'll... I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think I think it's a challenge for us to take back. And, and first of all, make sure if we've got it in the right order and, and pay some attention to it, because I don't know that I paid as much attention to that as I should as we were framing the order and also then what that means. So we'll take we'll take that as a challenge to, to think about how we stack rank some of that and what that means for us in prioritization. Okay, great. And then all my questions are kind of along the same theme, um, but, you know, not to be nitpicky, but I, I noticed in the... The guy, and by the way, I thought the whole presentation was great, so I'm not, you know, overly critical here. But the on the guiding principles, I did notice that I didn't see a principle that aligned with the idea of impact or results. Or, uh, you know, Councilmember Arenas just asked, "How do we know if we're helping the people who most need help, who have been most neglected by the systems and structures in our society?" And I think, it, it, for personally, it's important to me to know that our efforts are being that we're measuring we're learning we're doubling down on things that are working we're focused we're relentlessly focused on the impact we want to have we're not just kind of pursuing 50 strategies that all sound good and just kind of spreading the peanut butter real thin as as uh as an analogy i've, I've heard yeah uh, others use so does that make sense it, it does and we actually pulled back from including detail on outcome measures at this point because we they, they aren't baked enough sure. <laughs> and and so part of what we wanted to do was rather than have a series of independent outcome measures for each of the six is we we need to sit back as a team give the team some time as a team and and with that central focus on people ask and answer the question you, you just posed which is what is the impact that we're going for? How do we know when we're going to get there? What are we going to measure and how are we going to hold ourselves accountable for it? And, and as uh, somebody who's a big fan of, of, of objectives as measured by key results, part of what we are talking about is having a single set of OKRs or objectives as measured by key results for this enterprise priority. And then the work aligning up to that, being able to check in on that on a quarterly basis, bring that back to you a, 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 on a quarterly basis and hold ourselves accountable both for the taxpayers' funds and for the work of our staff and our many partners. So it felt premature to bring that now because we really haven't 
haven't figured out what those are, but our intent is that the next iteration of work, if we're mostly in the right direction here, is to begin to develop that on a very robust and disciplined way. That's great. That uh, Kip was actually going to be my next and final question, which was timing of some kind of OKR model. So you, uh, I don't think you answered timing, but it sounds like we're heading that direction, which is, which is good. I, I will say, um, at the risk of, of being annoying, I, I do think it can still be a core principle, even if it's not something that we're able to report out on yet. So I, I just, I'd encourage us, so a core principle I would advance is if we're not measure, having measurable impact and making that a priority, I think we'd have a problem. I, maybe it was assumed, but I'll just repeat the point. Um, okay, thanks. This, thanks again for the update. Really excited about this work. We appreciate all the efforts today. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Davis. Thank you. I want to thank staff for the presentation. This was um, very heavy information, um, and I appreciate the, the emphasis on how hard it's going to be to transition this work out of EOC. Um, it may be the hardest thing the city's ever done, but I was thinking, isn't, wasn't having half the city staff in the EOC, the hardest thing you guys ever done, did? Um, maybe this is the second hardest, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I, I debated that myself. I think I think it's like it's climbing the mountain, right? It's really hard to get up, but sometimes it's equally as hard to get back down and yeah. make sure everybody gets down safely, right? Yeah, you don't always get to do the fun rappelling down. Um, so I get that. Uh, I wanna also thank my colleagues for their comments and questions. I had many and I'm was checking them off. I wrote down the opportunity ecosystem and uh, council member Arenas talked about that. Council member Mahan, of course, talked about uh, dashboards and OKRs and, <laughs> and objectives and outcomes. And I appreciate that because I was wondering the same thing and kind of on the flip of that um, in the place-based approach, you talked very, and this might be also not qu quite baked yet. You talked about indicator data to identify the neighborhoods and, and there weren't uh, specifics on the indicator data. I don't know if they'll be, I'm guessing that will be based on kind of what we're looking for in terms of outcomes as well. So can you give me some sense of what we're looking at to identify the neighborhoods that we want to use this place-based approach? Yeah, please. Thank you, Council Member Davis. How's the mic? Good? Good. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Kind of just piggybacking off of what Kip said, we do need to work with our recovery departments to again, kind of align at the program level, um, what indicators um, they believe they will be impacting, but also like, taking the lead from the Office of Racial Equity on those uh, income indicators, the race and um, ethnicity indicators. Um, but we really have multiple sets of data sources that we've been using, and we just need to start thinking about um, landing, landing and adopting something that works for us. So again, we have a uniform common understanding of not just what we're measuring, but where we're measuring. So we can do the compare and contrast. So um, it's going to be a process. And I think we've got the right team and we've got the right next steps to move forward. And we will obviously bring those forward to you all for your um, input and adoption of those. Thanks, and I, I appreciate the um, the mapping. I really like the fact that we kind of map our data. Um, I think the I maybe I'm just a spatial person, but I think it's really helpful to to see it that way. Um, I did since you asked the questions um, about what might be the benefits or challenges to the place based approach. I my concern is how we cover all of the areas without making our staffing too thin. I think, what, what did Council Member Mayhem say? <laughs> Spreading the peanut butter too thin. Um, I think that's that's a concern for me, especially if we have hard hit areas, as we know, across districts that aren't concentrated. So I have a couple of, um, of harder hit areas and socioeconomically disadvantaged areas in my district. Most people don't think of District 6 as having that but they're not, they're not even near each other. So, um, or they're separated by a freeway. So you couldn't just have like one center. Uh, I think the, the economic recovery talked about having one center and, and placing it on the east side, which 
cool, great for East Side. Um, what about District One and District Six, and how how would they get over there? So I think that's that's the challenge, um, and mobility for for folks even because you're not going to be able to have one in every single neighborhood and how you how you locate them and where you locate them uh, in relation to transit is going to be really important. Um, and then I'm sure those are things you you've already thought of. The other thing, and this was discussed a little bit with previous council members uh, who spoke as well, the integration of services, moving things out of the the EOC, which is by nature ad hoc, but also agile. Um, into back into departments makes me fear a little bit for re-siloing these services and and people not having that um, agility that they had or that same mindset that they had during the, during the EOC where you're talking to people who aren't on your floor so to speak um, since and since we weren't in city hall we didn't have we didn't have that physical separation as even though we were more physically separated, we didn't have the physical separation of different floors. Um, and so that's another thing that I think might present a challenge. And I just want, I'm sure you guys are already thinking about this because I know that's how Kip thinks. And I know many of you are thinking about this already, but I just wanted to, to bring that up because that wasn't something that was discussed. The boxes in the EOC, um, when you do the EOC org chart, I know are super fluid and the boxes in the org chart for our departments are much less fluid or have been, were, were prior to COVID. And so I don't want those to firm up again. And yeah, those are just my, those are my comments. I, if anyone wants to react, especially to the challenge for staffing, doing a place-based approach and the, the interdepartmental coordination um, where you guys are on that. I, I'd really appreciate some. I, I'd love to just jump into some on both, both of those. I think, Thanks. you know, one of the things, um, one of the things we realize is how important partners are and, 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 and how our nonprofit partners in particular have the ability to reach a wide variety of places and people that are harder or more expensive or impossible for us to reach. And I, I, uh, was going to total it up, but we had a lot of other things to do. I, you know, there are literally hundreds of folks that we have uh, been working with. I think of, you know, for example, with the rental assistance is like 47 community partners as just an example on one program. And so I think we have a real opportunity to support that ecosystem. And that ecosystem should and could be have the capacity to reach into all of the neighborhoods that are impacted, including the ones that, that are in pockets uh, that tend to be more in uh, on the uh, west side of town, um, where you get more isolated pockets of poverty rather than larger, larger extended neighborhoods so that's a, that doesn't answer the question completely but that'll be one of our approaches is to work with partners and to build their capacity to to reach there realizing that it's not just throwing the money and expecting them to do it there are other solutions as well um on the on the question of the move into departments uh, i'd like to say it was intentional but i think one of the one of the things that the pandemic has done for us and will done for us is is Everybody who is leading this from the departmental level has seen the benefit and the ability to, to do cross-departmental teams using agile methodology that delivers results. And so I think uh, rather than, than you know, some geeks waving their hands, you have a lot of skilled practitioners now. And we're actually gonna continue to extend some of that cross-departmental work within the departments. Um, for example, uh, Jill Mariani uh, has, has volunteered to do a tour of duty, staying within the PRNS structure for at least a while uh, part because of her passion and the, her lived experience with food insecurity. So we'll build that in. And then where it's not purely in a department, we'll spend a little time creating an agile governance structure that recognizes for example, in digital equity, that they're going to need IT, they're going to need public works, they're going to need civic innovation, um, in addition to their ability to do it by themselves, if we're going to do it right. So my, my hope is that this is actually a way to kind of steal some of that uh, lightning and bring it back into the organization and make the organization 
uh, departmental organizations more nimble, more agile, and more open to cross-departmental work, not by forcing it on them, but by allowing them to continue to use models which they now know well and have, have demonstrated in practice. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And I think um, also just making sure that at all the different points of entry that Parks and, Recs fo Parks and Rec folks know about the uh, the library services that are available and can say, oh, hey, did you know you could check out a hotspot? Just those little, um, at every different kind of point of entry where a resident might have an interaction with the city, if people are cross-trained to know what else is available um, from the city and the county, because now we know more about, about food insecurity and about the food programs that we can connect people to, for example. Um, I, think, I think even just that will help have, will help enhance the services for our residents, which is really, of course, the goal in all of this. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Foley. Thank you. Thank you for a really great presentation of looking back over a year and a half or a year plus and looking forward to where we can go it to, to build back better. Uh, I, I really appreciate some of the comments that both the public comments are made and then the, and the presentations by the, by all the staff members, they were, it was really uh, useful. One, one comment in particular was uh, from Zolma when you mentioned uh, lead, that we lead with race, but recognizing the intersectionality. I think that's a really impactful statement because while uh, race is important and that's what drives our equity decisions, there's also gender, age, LGBT status, disabilities, et cetera, that are the intersectionality that means that all of, there may be a member of the BIPOC community who, is, who represents all those other categories as well. And we need to make sure that we're taking care of all of our residents. Um, I just wanted to, uh, you, you already answered the question about the funding. That was a question that I had. Uh, several other questions were raised. I just want to throw out some groups that might be included in a task force when we get together and that, or when you create it, and that is a member of the disability uh, community, um, members of the arts community to echo Council Member Perales's statement. It's really important when, when I think of the businesses and the organizations that are struggling or that will be the longest before they come back and thrive. It's the arts community, perform, particularly the performing arts community. So if we can embrace them and involve them in a discussion on how to help improve or impact their lives from a small business standpoint or a, a, a place what, from whatever standpoint, just including them, would be uh, helpful, I think. Um, uh, you also already answered my questions about the Eviction Help Center. I think that's uh, one thing I just want to throw out there. I, it is incredibly important that we focus on the areas of greatest need in the city of San Jose. But there are areas of need in all of our districts. So we need to make sure that we take a look at some of the areas in other districts that have need as well. They may be quieter, they don't have as big a numbers as uh, that are affecting, being affected by evictions or COVID, but they are being affected nonetheless. We still have small businesses that are show, shutting their doors in all of our districts, not just downtown, uh, all over the all over the city that we need to provide resources to them and, and help our small businesses out. So anything we can do when we're considering small business assistance that we think of all of our small businesses, not just the geographically where they're located, because these are really family businesses who are employing 
maybe just themselves, one, two, three people, they're paying their taxes, they're paying rent, they're paying uh, employees uh, who then are able to pay their rent and take care of their families. So I want to, I don't ever want us to lose focus on small businesses all over the city of San Jose, particularly when I uh, heard a statistic, I think Nancy had it, prior to COVID, we had 150,000 people employed by small businesses. That's, that's incredible. So, uh, I really, I like the term better normal too. I, I really don't like the phrase build back better. It's just not good English, but that's okay. It's the word, it's the three words we have. And those are, that's the mantra that we'll go forward with. I look forward to more detail and, uh, and the utilization of the funding that we need to make some of these programs happen. But I really am impressed with the work that and presentation that you made today and the the vision of the city going forward. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Councilmember Carrasco. Thank you so much. <coughs> um, you know, um, <coughs> I'm sorry, I have terrible allergies. I hope it's not my new kitty. <coughs> Uh, you know, thank you so much, staff, for a, a really great and very thorough presentation. 80 pages, wow. Uh, <laughs> there's not much I can add other than, <coughs> you know, I want to thank you for, I want to thank you for the work that you've been doing over the past 13, 14 months, uh, <clears throat> and all of the volunteers that so bravely came out in spite of the fears around COVID-19, the unknowns around COVID-19, and, uh, <clears throat> and also just the stressors that this pandemic has put on all of our families. Uh, so I'm very grateful. If it weren't for our volunteers who stepped up, uh, I'm sure that uh, the kind of work that, that took place to, uh, you know, to get the food distribution to our neediest families, uh, those who really were just so strapped and under so much pressure and so much stress, um, a lot of this work would have been even so much more difficult for our staff uh, to get done. So I just wanted to really um, thank them for, for all of that. <coughs> and, uh, and, you know, um, I, I guess I just have a, a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, questions. <coughs> As I'm dealing with some some uh, some issues that have really been uh, coming to the forefront, and of course, it's happening throughout the whole city, as uh, Councilmember Foley has just uh, expressed. Uh, I, I'm dealing with it because it's it's uh, it's just uh, uh, becoming a little bit more um, pronounced for some of our families, and this is of course dealing with some of our. Uh, homeless population. I've been, I've been talking to Jackie. I've been talking to, uh, my staff's been talking to Reagan and Olympia and uh, just uh, because of the complications. And of course, there's no easy answers for this. But someone mentioned uh, that there might be an opportunity to, to uh, take advantage of home key and to potentially acquire <coughs> um, some uh, motels. And I don't know who it was. It was early on in the presentation. So if staff could just help me out here. Yeah, Rachel. Jump in. Was that Rachel? Hi, council member. That was oh, me. Hi, Reagan. Reagan. With the housing department. Yes, I did mention home key. We are eagerly anticipating an additional round of home key funding from the state. And in, in anticipation of that funding, we are um looking at potential hotels and motels to acquire um and the the market is good right now for purchasing hotels and motels so there are a number of opportunities we're exploring rachel and, anything you want to add yeah we, uh, yeah thank you so much and, and what does that mean a, a second round that means that uh, the governor is looking at releasing some more funds is that correct that's right Okay, and um, and do you, if he does release funds, <coughs> there's probably a lot of unknowns, correct? I'm just wondering what that looks like for our city, 
how much could that potentially what that potentially could look like for us and um and in terms of uh uh what our responsibility would be i'm just trying to to understand what that would translate concretely and what we could be looking at concretely in terms of doors or units so that we could get some folks off the street and i know that this is a huge uh gar gargantuan lift uh, overall, but I just want, I just want numbers at this point. Uh, so if you could help me out with that. Sure. So but we don't yet know how much will be available, um, in home key funding, but we anticipate with home key and with measure E, we could, um, strike while the iron's hot, as they say, in terms of acquiring hotels and motels. Um, Rachel, did you want to chime in on just the number of units we're yeah, I'm just trying looking to at? Think about it. In um, so what we're trying to do, council member, is basically just create like as many options as we can right now because we know in doing this work that sometimes things don't come through. You know, it's it's hmm. you know we have to strike a deal. So. Um, so what we're doing is looking at as many options as we can. I would say that we are hoping to secure at least 200 um, more rooms through this process. That would be uh, that would be uh, wonderful for 200 individuals that uh, could potentially see uh, an actual bed and a roof over their their heads. Um, and and this would be. Uh, and, and I want to identify uh, who we're looking at to house. Uh, would these be for individuals who are currently on the street? Would this be for individuals who are about to lose their homes? Would this be for individuals who are in shelters? Who would be eligible for the home key program? So I think most immediately, council member, we would want to use home key hotels to house people who are currently homeless, unsheltered, or in some of our temporary shelters, such as South Hall. So that would be most immediately. And then depending on the site, it may be um, ideal for redevelopment um, in the future. So short-term housing the unsheltered from or housing people who are in our hotels and motels long term would be redevelopment into likely something some kind of denser affordable housing yeah okay um and uh and what's the timeline on this on when we would receive home key funding council member yes uh when we would know more concretely uh if the governor does release and how much that would be I might be able to, yeah. in. I, I, Reagan, I didn't mean to cut you off. You no, wanna, go ahead. Yeah, there, there's a lot of uh, legislative activity around that question about what's coming with the budget this year. And uh, I'll try to cut it down to a 60 second summary. Um, about a month ago, the mayors of the largest cities sent a letter to the legislative leadership and the governor uh, asking for $4 billion a year in one-time funding for homeless programs, including Home Key, uh, HAP, and a host of other programs stays, stays funded. This would be just a record amount, more than four times what had been previously proposed by the governor. And doing that every year for the next four years because of the large surplus that the state currently has. Um, we were successful in lobbying the legislative leaders because both the assembly and the Senate came out with budget blueprints that call for $20 billion a year over five years. Uh, again, that would be by far record setting for this state or any other. Uh, so we're grateful for that. Um, obviously the governor's, it's, it's in the governor's court at this point and the governor's budget will be due, I think in the next two weeks. I don't have that date on the top of my head. Um, so we're going to see what I have been assured is that there will be a multi-billion dollar commitment over multiple years. So we should expect that home key money to go up this year um, 
for the city, but uh, at this point, far too early for us to count any chickens. Okay, thank, thank you so much for that. Um, as you can imagine, uh, just uh, uh, things that continue to brew and they're getting hotter and hotter in, uh, in our neighborhoods and uh, <clears throat> in some neighborhoods a little bit hotter than in others. And, uh, and, and, and some folks are, um, are, you know, some of our folks who, who should be getting mental health services um, and, and more intense uh, wraparound services are starting to, you know, uh, move into residential areas. And, and this is becoming incredibly problematic, uh, especially where there are very young children uh, and uh, I'm experiencing uh, quite a bit of that. And so we're getting residents whom I, who are demanding and rightfully so uh, answers. And so I'm, I'm, I'm looking for answers. And I know that uh, the answers are, are, some answers are, they're not adequate. And uh, so we, um, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, if, if there's any possibility of getting that in the next two weeks, I know that that's uh, still uh, un unknown, but hopefully we'll, we'll have some answers. Being able to tell my residents something is, is imperative, uh, but something concrete, you know, I, I can't keep holding them off. This is, uh, this is uh, uh, some of these situations are very, they're hot, they're hot situations right now. So thank you for that. Um, and, um, and, and you know the 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 rest of it, you know, has been at, has been asked by my council colleagues. I appreciate the the very um, the the very uh, provocative conversations that are taking place, and uh, and and staff uh, really having thought very profoundly on these matters. Uh, you know, the 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 magic uh, is going to be in the recovery. Uh, families have suffered a great deal, and and. Uh, and to a great extent, they're, they're hanging on by a thread and hoping for some relief from us. And so I really appreciate um, much of the, of the work that you're doing and the thought, the deep thought that you put into, um, it, into the work, the future work that you'll be doing. Um, and, and I guess the, the, the last thing I'll say is, I, I do believe that the actions that we took uh, just a year ago in creating the office on, on, um, on race and equity uh, that's now being led by Suma Maciel is going to be very critical in the way that we move forward, the way that we gather data, and the way that we make uh, many of the critical decisions that are coming in our direction, mainly because, uh, mainly because when COVID-19 struck, it struck with this sense of vengeance on our communities of color. And when we talk about recovery, these will be the communities that will need our, our undivided attention and our very strategic focus in order to make sure that the city of San Jose recovers as a whole. A lot of other parts of the city are doing relatively well because individually they're doing well. Uh, families are, are still, you know, the, their children have received uh, support during their disconnect to schools. They're still receiving uh, uh, the kind of support that they needed. Uh, they may have fallen somewhat behind, but not like some of the other students who were completely disconnected for up to six, eight months, um, whose children are struggling, whose families were left with nothing, who are still in front of my house um, lining up for a couple of boxes of food. And so I, I do appreciate that there is, uh, you know, these, these multiple layers of, uh, of inequities that we have to take into consideration and there throughout the entire city, but but I do uh, I do appreciate that we have to lead with race because uh, because uh, 
if we haven't learned anything in these in this past year that COVID completely exposed is that our communities of color were were the hardest hit and they were the most disconnected and they lost the most. And so we have to make sure that they are uh, maybe not made whole, but that they are supported and that they are um, the, the focus of our attention. And so, and the last thing I'll, I'll say is uh, a few hours ago, I don't remember exactly when, we talked about uh, the idea of, of how we speak to our communities. And when we want to bring them into the conversations uh, language is, is everything. And uh, I talked about, you know, if, if you want to talk to my mother, I mean, she's not here now, but uh, the immigrant community, Latinx is probably not the best uh, way to speak to, to uh, folks. Uh, and, and of course, that's a point of, of controversy. And, and, I, and I spoke uh, openly about that. But the other is uh, that, that is also, you know, uh, there's a point of contention among the community. Uh, and I think at some point we're going to really have to have this conversation. Uh, those of us who, who are part of uh, uh, communities of color, BIPOC, uh, because some of us feel that we've been erased by, by not ha having been given the initial or by simply uh, uh, not being recognized any longer. So communities of color, uh, we're being recognized, but BIPOC deliberately, intentionally erases us from that conversation at that point. And so, um, so I, I think we have to be very mindful. I know that certain language, certain vocabulary, certain verbiage suddenly bubbles to the top and becomes uh, um, uh, the, the politically correct uh, verbiage in the moment. Uh, but um, I think that, uh, that sometimes uh, we have to be mindful as to whether or not everyone feels uh, included in that conversation. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah. we have other hands up. Can I we have, ask you to continue on? Absolutely. Anything? But I, I just wanted to make my point, uh, Mayor, because we're starting to use that language quite a bit. And I'm one of the council members that represents one of the biggest communities that uh, language like that is, uh, is being used to blanket it. So in our effort of recovery, or in our effort uh, to, uh, to uh, pass policy impacting communities of color, uh, I, I wanna make sure that we're very mindful of the language that we're using, especially as we're putting it into our literature, as we're leading an office on race and equity, and, uh, and as we're putting it into our presentations that we're very mindful of the language that we're using. Thank you, Council Member Jimenez. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate uh, what Councilmember Carrasco just said, and really do appreciate all the comments that have been made, all the questions that have been asked. There's a, as you know, there's a lot of information trying to take it all in, and, and I suspect that the next uh, study session or the next uh, meeting where we touch on this, so we'll be able to dig in a little bit more. Um, just, uh, I, I wanted to point out something that stood out to me, um, and it was probably a small part of everything that was presented. Um, and some of it was uh, really what was on slide eight. And that's where it has some language around community and economic recovery. And, and the part I wanted to point out that I thought it was very important, and I, I don't know who, who put this together. <laughs> I'm sure it seems like it was a group of folks, but uh, the last paragraph that says uh, recovery is not for us to do alone, rather this work must be done with the whole community for the benefit of those most burdened by the crisis. Uh, and the most important part for me um, is that last part, guided by their wisdom and tapping into their potential. And that's another important part for me uh, and building on their deep enduring strength. And, and, and the reason that, uh, at least for me, that stood out um, is that I, I, you know, I often get frustrated and it's not necessarily a conversation that always takes place here at council, but I think it's, um, a conversation in our society generally that, uh, and, and I don't believe our staff has this perspective, but just that this is exist in, in some folks in some of these disadvantages, com disadvantaged communities have sort of a, a antenna for this. And, and that is this idea that uh, folks in this, these disadvantaged communities are walking around with their hand out, just ready to, you know, <laughs> take up the assistance anytime. And, and so, uh, 
you know, what, what I know to be true, uh, and I don't think that's true, but what I know to be true is that certainly um, the vast majority, and this isn't just the Latino community, by the way, this is a Vietnamese community and immigrant community more broadly, actually, uh, but the vast, ma vast majority are hardworking folks who will really, what I've come to know is really only take assistance if they truly need it in all forms, right? From, from the government, from nonprofits, and, and some, I suspect, as my mother, uh, they would refuse assistance simply out of pride that they want to be able to provide for their family, even though they probably needed the assistance. Um, and, and so along those same lines, uh, what, what comes to mind, and, and the reason the word potential was important to me is, is that I often, and this is the part that frustrates me a little bit, is I often think that the narrative that we have around some of these communities, uh, disadvantaged communities, communities of color, poor communities, whatever we want to call them, right, because there's a lot of different terms thrown around, is really that the, in my mind, that we need to start moving. Uh, well, before I say that, I think it's important that we do it and we have done it. I think uh, time and again, really acknowledging the deficits and the challenges that many of these communities have uh, and continue to have historically and into the future, I suspect. Uh, but for me, I, I think it's also important to, uh, to, to, to move the conversation from the deficits and really start moving into and talking about potential. Because um, I think there's a lot of talent. There's a lot of a lot of that is just left on the table in this community, in these communities. Um, and so that's why it was important for me to say that. So, so what I just want to say is, to the extent the staff needs to be reminded, I suspect you don't, because you all seem very uh, self-aware and very uh, present of mind on some of these things. Is that uh, that just having these types of things in mind as we're reaching out to the community and offering assistance, right, uh, I think is very important to me. Um, and I'll just end with, you know, one uh, quote of Cesar Chavez, I think it was, forget exactly where he said it, but, uh, but, but it really resonates with me and I think it's appropriate to say it in this particular occasion, but he said something along the lines of, we do not want charity at the price of our dignity. Um, and I think it's very important for us as we go down this path that we have been on trying to provide services for people is that um, we don't necessarily devalue them as human beings or, or have this paternalistic stance towards them, but that we really embrace them for the potential uh, that they have, I, I think, just built within them, right? These are hardworking people that are resilient as hell. <laughs> um, and, and so I, I just don't want us to forget that in, in this whole conversation about uh, how we move forward uh, in a better way as a city and, and back to a better normal, as it's been said. So thank you for all the work. I appreciate it. Uh, I think the residents and, and we as a council are in a good good hands. Uh, you all are extremely smart, committed, uh, dedicated individuals, and, and that uh, shines very brightly to me every single meeting. Uh, so I very much appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask a, a few quick questions about sort of the strategy going forward. Um, first, for Nancy, you know, as we think about high growth, high wage jobs, and just the dislocation that so many of our workers have suffered, and it's going to remain, we know, in industries like hotels and um, travel and so forth. Um, I wonder about uh, opportunities in some old industries uh, here in Silicon Valley, and one specifically being the semiconductor uh, manufacturing. I don't know, a lot of folks think that left the valley a long time ago, but it is still happening here. There's just not enough happening of it anywhere in the world, apparently, because uh, everybody's on back order right now. Uh, audio manufacturers can't get a, a car off the line because they can't get enough chips. Uh, they're all going to personal devices. I'm just hearing about that the wars right now over trying to get supply. And I'm told that this is something that's going to be somewhat chronic over the next two to three years. And I, I wonder, is there any short-term opportunity in the city? I, I know it's not simple to just go stand up a wafer lab um, or a, you know, a, a semiconductor uh, uh, fab plant or any of that kind of stuff. But um, are there any opportunities for us to look at you know, key industrial sites that maybe were manufacturing in the past or maybe have the adequate power loads or whatever and for us to kind of work together with the constellation of companies that are here to say, hey, let's expand because these are jobs that are really good paying that don't require 
you know, college education, right? A lot of folks can go right into them. Um, are, are there any opportunities there? Mayor, you're raising something that's super interesting. And I think you know that uh, advanced manufacturing in general has been a very important uh, focus for both business development and Chris Burton and Jeff Rester in Work to Future. So um, I think there are, are a number of opportunities uh, that also lead up to that from rapid prototyping, et cetera, that are strong in the Valley. And, and Chris, I'm, I'm going to turn to you to, to express a bit of your thoughts about how this may move forward. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. You know, I think it is a really interesting opportunity. I think we're in that moment in time where it's sort of helping people realize the fragility of their supply chains and, and how they think about, you know, what portions of local operations can support their need uh, going forward. It, it's definitely something that we're exploring right now. We've started sort of doing some limited outreach to folks in that space uh, that we're going to continue just to understand uh, what the landscape looks like. Obviously, we did lose a considerable amount of that production capacity, but the infrastructure still remains. There are still buildings out there um, that do carry the high power load, um, and there are ways that we can work with employers to put, you know, the, the right facilities back in place um, in, in a pretty short order. So, um, so we think there's an opportunity. We're absolutely going to do the work to reach out to those companies, because as you say, uh, it's a tremendous opportunity to, to focus on middle income jobs that support a living wage for local residents. Well, Chris, thanks. Please include me in the outreach efforts. I'm happy to uh, take some time uh, my day to go hustle and see if we can convene a few folks who may have some interest in trying to fill that big gap in supply that's out there um, and see if we can get some folks to work. Um, Andrew, I had a question about all the data work that's being done um, that you're overseeing and I appreciate uh, great work that's being done now. I didn't hear any reference to the social progress index, which is something that you know the Silicon Valley Community Foundation helped to fund us getting up and running in 2019, uh, kind of focused on this census tract based approach to look at a whole host of indicators of human need um, across everything from health to, to jobs to education. And is that because the, the data wasn't good enough or was it not? Can you help me understand, is, are we leaving that behind or are we integrating it somehow in our work? So thank you, Mayor. Um, we are um, we have not embarked on really analyzing which data sets we're are are better or ones we're going to leave behind. We're going to embark on that sort of in our next um, in our next steps. So okay. right now it's we're literally at the neighborhood mapping stage, and then um, we're going to call together all the different data sets that we know the city are, is using, and determine collectively uh, what best suits our needs. So social okay. progress index will be one of those that we'll take a look at. Okay, great. I can imagine it's going to be super difficult to make sure data actually fits in the square peg fits in the round hole, whatever we've defined for each neighborhood. So I uh, appreciate that's not going to be easy, um, but I look forward to, to seeing how, how we can work through it all. Um, quick question for Kip. Um, I'm just worried about FEMA reimbursements for whatever we're doing for unhoused residents, does moving housing out of the EOC, or does moving some of this activity out of the EOC to the housing department? I know obviously it's the same people who are doing the work. <laughs> it's, you know, Rachel and, and Reagan and everybody, Jackie and everybody in the team, but does that undermine our efforts to get FEMA reimbursement if it's no longer a quote unquote? No, yeah. and, 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 and we've got very good people, including Ray and Luz, making sure that as we do these transition pieces, that, that, that we are taking that into account. Um, and if there's, there is something that would put like FEMA reimbursement at risk, that would be something that we might technically keep in the EOC or make sure is, is covered in a way that, that we're meeting the requirements. So that's, that's one of the considerations as we wind down is not to lose any money that's on the table, uh, including the FEMA reimbursement. Part of what we will need to do to support the departments is make sure that they understand all the FEMA requirements, which like any good federal bureaucracy uh, can be particularly complicated. And so we'll have actually a whole dedicated unit that will actually last for years 
of people who will be dedicated to the, doing the documentation, processing all of the grant works, not just for FEMA, but for the other sources. And we'll centralize more of that than we have in the past so the departments will have the support that they need and the understanding on how to do that documentation. That said, housing department uh, is very well versed in all sorts of very complicated bureaucracies and meeting their needs. So I have high confidence in them, but we'll make sure that they have the additional support that they need from, from the centralized unit. Yes. Um, Reagan, is there anything you wanted to add? You, you're closer to this than I am on, on many of these things. I think the one thing that I would add is just that local declaration of emergency as my conversations with um, Ray, sometimes that is helpful to still have in place, even though we are in a recovery phase. And so we'll work closely with um, Luz and her team and with Ray, um, checking in with each of the recovery teams, if you will, on um, whether or not that local emergency is still needed or beneficial to some of the recovery efforts we're implementing. And I would say the housing department has plenty of great bureaucrats who are um, well-versed and well-knowledged in complicated funding sources. You can speak federal East, that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, last question, this is a hard one. I guess I'll throw it at you, Kip, and let you punt it. Um, we, we've taken on an enormous uh, lift with food distribution. A lot of city employees have been involved. I know we've pulled some off, but um, I'm just wondering, given how we know if, if we have access to something, it, and it's true for all of us as individuals, if it is free, we will take advantage of that opportunity. I've done it many times myself. Um, and how can we be sure that what our residents don't need more of in a given moment, say, would be childcare, for example? Um, we know that if we offer food, we suspect, especially if you're struggling, of course you're going to take the food. Uh, and, or you may, you may not. I mean, I think Councilman Jimenez's point is very, very well taken. But, but how are we able to really discern that's the best marginal use of our dollars as opposed to helping uh, a lot of moms get childcare so they can go back to work, for example. Yeah, I, I'm actually just going to acknowledge the, the utility of that question. Uh, and I think, you know, part of what part of what we've been doing in response mode is, is, is frankly, everything we possibly can as much as we possibly can. Right. As we shift into recovery, I think a more intentional discernment, or, and this echoes some of the earlier comments around, What's the interrelationship between these? What's the prioritization among these? Um, and, and where, sh therefore, should we allocate our resources and dollars is exactly the, 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 the right budget conversation to be having. Um, our thought on food is that we really want to transition out of that as we move out of the food emergency. And we are hopeful in two ways around that. Um, one is that the Biden administration backed by the Congress, the moves that they've made really create substantial and sustainable differences in access to long-term food programs that if we actually get people who are eligible onto those programs, much of the food insecurity goes away or is carried by those programs. So that becomes a real priority for us. And we are in agreement with Second Harvest and our, and our other partners that that's a very good core strategy. Two, we believe that uh, the rising tide of the economic recovery, while it will not lift all boats, will lift many of them rapidly and that many people will be able and willing to transition off. And so we'll work on ramping that down and getting back closer to our normal posture as quickly as we can. Part of what we are gonna be recommending, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself on this, is that we don't allocate all of the dollars, but that we do keep some reserve funds that we can shift about as we learn where the real needs are. So if we find out, no, it is food rather than childcare, that we can put it to food. Or if we find out, no, it is childcare rather than food, we can go in that direction. So part of what we're not gonna do right now and on May 17th is predict out everything perfectly because we need to ask and answer that question 
uh, uh, and we need the team to be working across the different divisions to figure that out together. That's part of why we pull, pulled them all together in the working group is you get those smart people together and then you have them debate and decide and look at the data and look at the findings and, and, and just ask and answer those exact questions. So the answer is we don't know right now. We think we've got a pretty good balance. We know people need to be housed. We know they need to be fed. We know they need childcare. Um, but we don't really know what the optimal mix is. And I think that's part of what we'll be debating and bringing to you and, and the council for consideration as we go forward. But part of our strategy is to not fully allocate our resources to everything now so that we can adjust as we go. Okay, thanks, Kip. All right, uh, any other questions from the council? Councilmember Carrasco, I know I shifted away. Did you want to have any final questions? Okay, all right. I'm good, thank you so much. Okay, great. Really appreciate all the extraordinary work that's gone into this. Uh, this is hard, but this is really a thoughtful approach that's been taking. Uh, and I, I think uh, we know the hard work is still ahead. All right, let's, uh, I don't think we need a motion. Is that right? This is just for our information. Great. Uh, let's go on then to the final item for tonight. Uh, and that's item 8.1, which is approval of a loan commitment to the Kelsey Air Station. Uh, for the development of apartments over on North First Street. Uh, and Reagan or Jackie, are you taking this one? I'm handing it over to Rachel. Yes. <laughs> yes, good evening, um, Mayor Council and members of the public. My name is Rachel Vanderveen and I will be sharing my screen and um, Kemet Malkana, who is our division manager, will be providing the presentation this evening. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council. I'll be uh, a good. Uh, I'll be brief, given the uh, hour. I'm Kimmy Mawakana. I am uh, the, working as a division manager for the housing department, and Rachel and I will be providing you with a presentation on item 8.1, a funding commitment for the Kelsey Affordable Housing Development, uh, and this is in support of 113 new affordable apart apartments for development in the city of San Jose. Next slide. This, this development opportunity meets uh, several city priorities and policy objectives. First, uh, this action will add 113 new affordable apartments in San Jose, consistent with the mayor and city council's goal of building 10,000 new affordable apartments. Second, this development provides housing to some of the most vulnerable residents. This includes intellectually and developmentally, developmentally disabled individuals. Third, this development uh, leverages over $49 million in outside funding. Next slide, please. The Kelsey will include a mix of studios and two bedroom affordable apartments, plus two manager's units, all total 115 units. 34 of the affordable apartments will be for those with intellectual and or developmental disabilities. The remaining 79 affordable apartments will be composed of very low income, low income and moderate income households. All households will have access to community space, a rooftop garden, terraces, and community rooms on every floor. The Kelsey is located approximately 500 feet from a light rail station, a 15 minute walk to downtown San Jose, and just a little over a mile to the Deardon station. Next slide. We are requesting a funding commitment of $15,925,000 in city funds for this development. The Kelsey applied to the city for funding through the $100 million notice of funding availability that the housing department issued in 2018. The County of Santa Clara is providing 4 million in funding for housing for intellectually and developmentally disabled individuals. The State Department of Housing and Community Development is contributing 10 million in transit oriented development funds. It's also important that, to note that this development used SB 35 to streamline the development process. Next slide. Finally, construction of the Kelsey is slated for early 
2022 to begin and to be completed in the summer of 2024 with lease up activities done concurrently. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention my appreciation for Stephen Jackson, the Senior Development Officer, and Shante Spears, the Housing Planning and Policy Administrator, who uh, expended a lot of hours to get the project to this, this point today. Um, this concludes our presentation and we are available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. Uh, this is a, looks like a wonderful project and a really beautiful design. Uh, Councilmember Perales? Yeah, Mayor, I think we have uh, some people from the public. If we can go oh, I see. Forgive me. I'm sorry. Thank you very much for pointing that out. Okay, let's go to the public first. Uh, Catherine Hedges. Um, good afternoon, Mayor, Council, Housing Department. Um, Thank you very much for all your hard work in this project. And I wanna thank the people at the Kelsey and all of their uh, consultants. This is an excellent project. Um, it's going to be a great asset to the community. They've worked on the architecture to make it fit in the community. They've worked on uh, concerns about traffic and people picking up and dropping off. Um, and it has all these wonderful features of being close to light rail and a fabulous example of infill development. And I really recommend it highly and I hope that it can get all of its funding so that it can be completed. Um, every month that they're not able to build is a month that their costs are going up. So um, I highly recommend approving this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Matthew, welcome. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. I'll, I'll be brief. We, we are strong supporters of this project. We've worked with the Kelsey for a number of years. Um, this is a tremendous opportunity. The, the, the backstory on the, the location is really important. I think the, the, the communication and work with the community has been very important. Um, it's a tremendous location. Um, we, we lauded their effort and coordinating with other groups in the county to bring resources in uh, to provide the money for uh, individuals with developmental disabilities. Great example of an opportunity to integrate people into a community um, in a way that provides support um, both for that community and, and, and for the folks that otherwise don't have a whole lot of options. Um, I just like to say this is a, a, a way of building a resilient beachhead for folks that are otherwise um, left vulnerable when there are shocks. Um, and I think we've seen over the last year that um, affordable housing developments are able to provide a range and a breadth of support systems for folks that that help help them collectively weather um, the, the 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 kinds of challenges that they faced in the last year and we, we think that's a real learning opportunity and this is a great example of a project like that will be, be an asset in the future thank you thank you uh, Brian Prescott Hi. Hello. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, and thank you for opening this to the public. So for the record, my name is Brian Prescott. Um, I live downtown in District 3, and I'd like to express my support for this project and respectfully ask for your yes votes uh, to accept staff's recommendations here. Um, so this project is right in my backyard. I could easily walk to this, uh, you know, in 15 or 20 minutes. I just think it's a superstar candidate for the housing fund that we have. Um, they have an incredible story about inclusivity, especially for people who are living with a disability. Uh, in particular, I like that we're putting this right next to a light rail station. So uh, people who are unable to drive can save a lot of money on the paratransit services that they might usually use to get from the transit routes. Uh, instead, the light rail can drop them off right at home. Um, I would also like to applaud this as part of our approach to homelessness. The Mercury News reported that in fiscal 2019, we spent about $5 million uh, clearing encampments, which is a really expensive way 
to juggle this problem. Here instead, we have a loan of 15 million. So that money is going to come back to the city. And 10 years from now, we're looking at, I guess, 113 people who were at risk and never had to become homeless in the first place. And that's the absolutely best outcome that we can have. So like I said, I live nearby. I think this is good news for the neighborhood. I think it's good news for the city. Uh, most importantly, it's gonna be good news for the people who are going to live there. So respectfully ask for your yes vote. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bob Bigsby. Am I muted? Uh, no, we can hear you now. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I live on Ayer, so I live right here. I am strongly supportive of this. I love the project uh, for four basic high-level reasons. Um, I just think humanly, it's something, no matter what anybody's background is, ideologically or whatever, we can get behind the housing crisis in a, in a unique way. And that leads to my second reason. I think it hits San Jose identity. I've only been a part of this city for seven years, and I have loved this city for 30 years. I'm very proud of the entrepreneurial, innovative uh, place that it is, and and the, you know, we're we're blessed in a, in a lot of ways. And this project is both entrepreneurial and innovative, and that leads to my third reason. I think it's a model. When I travel around, I, I I like talking about this project because I think it's a model that could be followed by other uh, cities. And I think we ought to lead in that way because a lot of people around the country may have a negative view of the Silicon Valley. And uh, and then I love the people. These are people who are not, you know, theoretical about helping people with disabilities. They're intimately acquainted with it. And uh, they are, uh, some of them do uh, deal with disabilities. Uh, this is uh, the real deal. And then it's going to be aesthetically appealing because they're committed to the dignity of the inhabitants in a way. More than just providing a roof over their heads, they're committed to their dignity. Huge fan of the project. And so I, I just uh, uh, ask for a yes vote from the council members. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Sherry Burns. Good evening, Mayor Licardo, members of the City Council and staff. My name is Sherry Burns, and I'm the Executive Director of Silicon Valley Independent Living Center, Center and a native San Jose resident. I'd like to offer my enthusiastic support for the Kelsey Air Station project and the requested land acquisition and loan funding from the City of San Jose. The Kelsey Air Station is well thought out. It's a beautiful project that offers a fully inclusive, mixed stability, mixed income housing community of 113 mixed size apartment homes. And several of the units, as you heard before, will be set aside for lower income residents with intellectual and developmental disabilities, especially important for transition aged youth with disabilities, as well as for adults with disabilities who are ready and wanting to transition out of nursing facilities and into affordable community-based housing. The project includes universal design principles throughout with community, commercial and outdoor space and community cafe. It's located approximately 500 feet from the VTA Japantown light rail station and has a transit oriented project. The residents will be encouraged to utilize environmentally friendly public transit bikes and ride sharing options. The Kelsey Air Station is exactly the kind of housing that the city of San Jose needs. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, Christine Fitzgerald. Welcome, Christine. So I can't just follow my boss. My, my name is Christine Fitzgerald. I also work at the Silicon Valley Independent Living Center. This project is a very needed project, and I too wholeheartedly support this project. It's going to give a lot of people a chance to get their boots on the ground and really be able to be on in the community rather than in <clears throat> otherwise <clears throat> institutionalized setting, home with their families or another less savory position. This would also make it possible for them to live, work, and play close in to downtown San Jose, as Sherry has mentioned, uh, really very close to the uh, Japantown station, so they can come and go as they please. Uh, this um, 
unit, this uh, this uh, housing unit, will also be accessible for everybody. And that's really the whole uh, reason behind universal design, is to allow people to age in place with dignity, respect, and every bit of ability that they can possibly have. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all the members of the community came to speak. Uh, I really want to express uh, gratitude to many of the neighbors who've worked out many of the issues with the developer and, and, and you know, the developer, I really want to thank Michaela Connery and uh, Olia uh, Krasnick, please forgive me, uh, the architect over at Cirrus Regis uh, and, and the entire team who worked together. I know that, uh, that our own planning staff, Stephanie Farmer and many others worked very hard. Uh, there were a lot of concerns because there is a single family neighborhood uh, very proximate, that is right behind this project. I live about 15 blocks away, um, and I appreciate uh, how the great effort that has been taken, even with an SP35 project, to really work with neighbors to ensure that this would be something that would be a great asset to the community and obviously critically essential uh, for the more than 130 um, uh, people who will be living, uh, the households that will be accommodated here. I, I just wanted to note, um, obviously, this is critical housing for so many, but you know, we often uh, on the council have a strong tendency to say, well, you have to build all the units on site with inclusionary, inclusionary money isn't as good as having this, the, the units on site. And I can appreciate that perspective. But in this case, this is $5 million of inclusionary fees that were paid by a market rate developer. Um, and First, it tells us, yes, we do need market rate development to be able to pay those fees. So we have them for projects like this that are great projects. Uh, and secondly, um, that if they had built the units on site, obviously we wouldn't have this flexible funding that we can use in a pinch like now uh, when an affordable developer looks like they're running uh, high on costs and they need some help as we've had a supplement in this case. And we really wanna get a good project uh, out of the ground. And so I, I just think um, this is $15 million is absolutely, uh, well, I guess it's a little more than 15, it's almost $16 million. It's well worth the investment uh, for all the people who will benefit from this. And I'm grateful that everyone's worked so hard to make it work. I really want to thank Councilmember Raul Peralz, who's been, I know, a great champion of this project. I know there were a lot of hard feeling uh, that had to be, um, had to be, you know, we had to have very honest conversations and I appreciate Councilmember Member Pross, uh being there right uh, in the middle of those conversations to help uh, this project get to success. I also want to thank Kelly Klein on our team here uh, in the office. Councilmember Member Pross. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, and a, a lot of thank yous as well. And you, you listed them off, but I, I think just doubling down, uh, this, there's been a tremendous effort from both city staff uh, your staff included um, from from my team and then certainly from the Kelsey team. Uh, it, this uh, has been, um, I think, really a, a terrific effort and uh, certainly not without its challenges um, on, on all ends. Uh, but I think I want to say thank you as well to the, to the community um, for, for working with us through this project. I think as, as you heard in some of the comments, um, that is not where, where we started on this project and actually some, uh, a, a few uh, development opportunities prior to this project coming forward as well that I think left a bad taste in a lot of the, the, the neighboring uh, community members. Um, and so I, I would say uh, just I think all around uh, really appreciated working uh, on this project. And uh, I want to say thank you to Michaela. Uh, she and I shared uh, history with um, I think this this project and um, it's actually named after her cousin and uh, and, and just wanted to, to be able to, to, to stress how important it is to have a project like this that's going to be able to house people with intellectual or developmental disabilities uh, and to be able to house them amongst uh, other individuals, those that are, are uh, extremely low income, low income and moderate income, truly a uh, mixed use and, and fully inclusive development. Um, and for me, 
uh, my my aunt has lived her entire life with cerebral palsy and she lives on her own uh, in Redwood City and this was after uh, shortly after being born uh, my grandmother being told that uh, she should give her up uh, for uh, permanent care because she probably would not live long and that she would be too much work for uh, for my grandmother and my grandfather and uh, and my my grandmother did not take that advice and uh, and was able and this is uh, at a time uh, 60 years ago that was a little more challenging to get a lot of support but but was able to, to, to locate some support and ultimately uh, through a lot of hard work uh, by both my grandparents and specifically my aunt uh, was uh, she was able to to become independent uh, and, and get a job and, and, and take care of herself but one of the the major challenges and, and, and specifically actually till today as she's retired now and, and aging uh, has been the proper type of housing she lives uh, on her own uh, in a duplex in redwood city and uh, by no means is uh, the housing inclusive uh, it's, it's not built uh, in a way that, that really uh, can help her live her best life uh, and 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 that's what this development is going to do not only is it going to be uh, be able to, to to be inclusive of, of uh, individuals with disabilities but it, it's simply just going to be a, a fully inclusive uh, apartment a complex where uh, you're you're able to live freely in and amongst everybody uh, and, I, and I just really want to say thank you to uh, again the, the Kelsey team to Michaela for your vision your efforts on this project I'm beyond proud that they were able to, to, to get this project approved here in district 3 uh, and uh, and then for tonight uh, proud to obviously be able to uh, to make the motion to approve this funding. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll make that motion. Thanks, Mayor. Second. Okay. Thank you, Council Member. I also want to just add to the thanks. Thanks to Kemet Mawakana and all the housing team uh, for being able to really push this over the goal line. This is, a, I know, a very challenging project in many ways. Uh, and the important projects always are challenging, obviously, serving neighbors. With disabilities it's really critically important so appreciate everyone taking on the challenge and, and continue to push all right uh, any other comments all right let's uh let's vote then Menes. yes morales yes cohen cohen aye Carrasco. aye davis yes Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, that wraps up our work. I think we're on to open forum. Uh, any member of the public can speak on an item not on the agenda. Roland, welcome. Thank you, Mayor. I'll try to be brief. Um, and first of all, I want to thank you all for, um, you know, approving uh, Council Member Daisy's um, uh, memo on the item 7.1. But what really struck me is all these comments from members of the public about the in impact of light on birds. A and I used to walk through Hyde Park at night, which is brightly lit, you know, for safety reasons, obviously, because of all the issues in London. And the squirrels and the birds couldn't possibly have been, you know, any happier. So, so as you know, yes, I do have a foreign accent, and um, and I'm not small, and I'm definitely not female, but I do know how to Google. So here is what I found out. I found um, a research paper authored by half a dozen uh, Chinese PhD, which is entitled "The Relationship of Spectral Sensitivity." with growth and reproductive response in avian breeders. And, and basically what this research paper says that light, the effect of light on birds is one of the most extensively studied topics anywhere in the world because it's used, it's used by breeders. And to summarize what the paper says is that if you use a combination of light frequency 
and actually they like color, you can either have bigger birds or you can have birds, you know, that um, achieve, uh, you know, um, uh, sexual maturity earlier, which means they're going to be breeding eggs earlier. Or you can actually use that light for the city of San Jose to actually have the very best birds in the entire world if we do it right. Thank you, and I'll be forwarding the link to you in due course. Thank you, Rowan. Uh, Catherine Hedges? Hi. Um, thank you very much, Mayor and Council. And I wanted to thank uh, Councilor Perales for his uh, wonderful speech in support of the Kelsey. Um, that story is such a great way to um, acknowledge uh, you know, what it's like for people with disabilities. And um, so this leads me to the point that I had left out of an earlier discussion that um, it's just outrageous that a city the size of San Jose does not have an ADA coordinator, does not have a funded Office of Disability Affairs and uh, what needs to be done to find the funding for these essential offices because you know, an estimated 20% of the population has a disability and we're leaving those people behind. We don't, we don't even know there's a problem until something's implemented and then you start getting complaints. So, and it's much more efficient to just design things properly from the start. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thanks everybody. The meeting's adjourned.